Okay. Check one, two, check one, two. No tunes coming in today, guys. Um, it's nothing personal. I know you're probably quite attached to the the tunes that we normally play coming in. <laughs> but today there's no tunes because I'm on StreamYard, as you can see. It's slightly different. I use StreamYard now when I've got guests because it just works a whole bunch better. So I'm on StreamYard and welcome everybody who is on the stream. I think I'm live. It says I'm live. It says that I'm streaming live at the moment. Um, I can see there's 12 people. So obviously people are just going to start streaming in, I hope, soon. But I'm going to obviously do what I normally do and just ask you for some feedback in regards to the audio quality, um, make sure that everyone can hear me fine, hear me okay, make sure that everything's working, and then we'll kind of be good to go. So yeah, the, the room's filling up quickly. We got just under 40 people in the room now, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, I think we're good. Audio is cool. That's what I wanted to see. Okay, fantastic. So good, good evening from the UK. Uh, I think it's uh, afternoon in America and whatever other time you've got if you're tuning in for somewhere different do feel free to uh, just drop a, a comment let me know where you're tuning in from it's always nice to see where different people are um, basically connecting from and as you can see I mean someone commented and they said that um, been ready for this alchemy and me I'm just gonna put I'm gonna just put that on the screen he said I've been ready for this yeah and the reason I'm adding that comment to the screen right now is because actually I've been really really excited about today's live stream I was actually very excited when Professor Ampim got in contact with me um he's someone that I'd been very interested in linking up with um there's one particular reason why I actually really wanted to get him on the channel and I had a bit of a chat with him I think it was um, earlier in the week. And he's done some amazing research um, towards a book that he's producing called Modern Fraud. Um, and I, I think he, I'm not sure if he, actually, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure he is aware, but I just don't feel like enough work is done in that area by researchers of any ilk. I think actually the forgery, the, the forgers and the fakers and the Eurocentrists um, who for years have been tampering, changing, erasing, deleting evidence, planting false, um, planting false artifacts and mixing them up with the real stuff have been getting away with it for, you know, centuries. We have to say centuries now because um, this is something that started in the 19th century um, and they've been getting away with it for far too long. And no one has really made an attempt to really address that. But my guest today has, and I'm very excited to that work. And um, we'll talk about that when I um, add him to the stream. He's, he's here, he's had a waiting in the wings at the moment, but I've just been really excited. And obviously, so I kind of entered my um, pursuit of Dr. Ampin on that basis. And then obviously just coming across the various articles. He's got several articles online, by the way, that are kind of freely available that he's published already. And they're, they're all very excellent. And I was actually just blown away by the work he's doing at the moment on the ground. One of his great strong points, and I'm going to read out his intro in a minute, but one of his greatest strong points is the primary research he does. He is very much on the ground right there Egypt, Nubia, um, Kush. I'm going to distinguish between the three of those because um, he'll tell me off if I don't do that. Um, so, um, you know, he's he's on the ground there doing some, I, I can't even call it just valuable work because that's an understatement. The work he's doing in those places is literally priceless. So this is going to be a very amazing stream. Um, as much as I'm going to hopefully be conducting an interview, I'm going to be fanboying a little bit as well. Because like I said, I'm a massive, massive fan of Professor Ampin's work. So I'm just going to read a bit of an introduction. And then I'm going to introduce our guest or at least allow him to join the stream so you can all see and meet uh, the great professor. So Professor Manny Ampin is a historian and primary first-hand researcher specializing in African and American history 
and culture, sorry, African and African American history and culture. He has a Master of Arts in History and African American Studies from Morgan State University. His master's thesis, the revolutionary Martin Luther King Jr., um, is being expanded into a two volume work entitled Martin Luther King, The Evolution of a Revolutionary. He has taught in the Department of History at Morgan State University and at San Francisco State University in the Department of Ethnic Studies. Sorry, that's my PC doing this weird thing. <laughs> also, Ambim has studied at Oxford University in England and collaborated on a NASA-sponsored research project which examined the ancient climate and migration patterns in Africa. Currently, Professor Ampin is a tenured professor of history and Africana studies and the chair of the history, anthropology and geography department at Contra Costa College, San Pablo. He is also the director of Advancing the Research Oakland, where he created a seven step primary research methodology home training course. Now, the next part of this introduction goes into the amazing work he's doing in the field, but I think we're going to save some of that for our discussion because there's going to be there's going to be a lot to uncover today. So if you're here and you're with me and you're excited, please do hit up the likes. OK, um, be vocal in the chat um, and let's just make this another fantastic stream because we always have really amazing live streams together. So. Um, yeah, let me invite our guest and allow him to join now. This is uh, Dr. Um, sorry, Professor Manu Ampim. Hello, sir. Well, thank you, Brother King. I'm, I'm glad to be with you uh, on this Sunday. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to have you. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I've been really, really excited to get you on the channel. Um, you were just very warm and welcoming. And actually, you seemed equally excited to be on the channel, which is an absolute, um, yeah, that was a privilege for me. So thank you very much for like agreeing to be on the channel. Um, there's a lot to uncover. When we started chatting last week, or sorry, earlier in the week, when we started chatting, we went in about six or seven different places. <laughs> and we were like, okay, we need, a, we need to focus in on a topic because there's so many things that we could talk about. Um, before we dive into the main topic, which is Kush, I know you've got a presentation. Am I correct there? Yeah, I have a few slides so that the people can can visualize what we're talking about. Yes, sir. Yeah, you've done some amazing work, and I, I'm going to allow you the ground to basically introduce Kushology to my audience who need to hear about it. But also, I just before we dive into that, I did want to just kind of touch a little bit on, and this is because I, I did reveal this to you before, the work that I'm doing at the moment, all the work that I do on this channel, most of it has been heavily built on the foundation of the fact that I spend a lot of time doing, excuse me, doing uh, facial reconstructions of ancient Egyptian artifacts. I do, I spend a lot of time. And I think coming from an educational background like yourself, it's very much been my, it's been a drive for me and a motivating factor to actually become quite specialized in that area. So I spend a lot of time understanding the processes around forensic facial reconstruction and all those other things to be able to bolster my work. And I've learned so much in that process about phenotypic diversity in Africa, about the different kind of um, changes and the so the differences that are that exist between populations and ethnicities i spent a lot of time in that area and because of that i've got a real or at least i would say i'm developing a real habit and a real skill for being able to spot when something doesn't quite fit into the comedic structure rule set for artwork for expression when something just doesn't fit and i'm i i say it quite confidently people in my channel will know i say quite confidently i think that's a fake or i don't think that's real and i won't say it willy-nilly i'll say because it's <laughs> got a few you know quite clear tip check marks so you started a work that i know you're working on at the moment called modern fraud can i ask you what motivated that piece of work was there like one piece of artwork or was it the whole bunch? What was it that motivated you to start that piece of research that you did there? 
Well, I appreciate the question. I started my primary or first-hand research back in 1989, and I did an 11 country tour in, um, in Europe because I recognized that there were millions of, of, of stolen artifacts throughout the, the different museums in Europe. So I traveled to the different museums, institutes, and libraries. I was based in the UK in 89 and 90. And as I began to go to the collections, I, I, I first started out to look at the, the high level African contributions to humanity and to, to prove and show and demonstrate and document that these were clearly Africans. But I began to notice a, um, a disturbing pattern and that every museum there had been artifacts that had been doctored up after discovery, not in antiquity. So I noticed that paints were stripped from reliefs, from statues, noses had not just been knocked off, but recarved and reshaped to give them a pointed aquiline appearance. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the width of the lips were shortened. And I noticed just the overall careful, meticulous, but in some cases clumsy facial reconstruction, whereby it became clear that there were modern conspirators who were involved with what I call the de-Africanization. And so this was the background in my work in Europe, uh, mm -hmm. careful systematic assessment of over a million artifacts. And I used that as, as a basis. So when I went to Kemet or so-called Egypt for the first time in, in 1990, I went to the Cairo Museum or the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, as people call it. And when I got to room 32, I was stunned. I saw two of the greatest forgeries in the history of ancient African archaeology. <laughs> so room 32 is the forgery room. And I decided that it was important to be able to observe and document the rules for the artistic art at the royal level and high official level because they were trained by the state in Kemet. And Can I those, ask you just really quickly yeah. what what piece that was or what pieces are, are they known pieces if, if, if you say them to me like, will i know them yes uh, and these are the rahotep and nafret oh. forgeries <laughs> yes so, of course so these Carry forgeries I, <laughs> I actually wrote about these forgeries in egypt child of africa ivan van Sertima edited that uh that issue of the journal of african civilizations and so uh there's a long list of rules that these forgeries have uh, that, that they violate so people mm. had assumed before my work that Rahotep and Nafret from the fourth dynasty, who are real historical figures, it's just that the statues of them in the Cairo uh, <laughs> collection are fake and phony. So uh, people assume. Just to ask you really quickly there, sorry, to yeah. cut, I don't want to cut you again, but just to ask you, is your opinion that they are complete and utter fabrications i.e they've just they've got limestone and just had their way with it or do you think they had existing statues which they then modified and changed like you said we did the reshaping what was your what's your gut feeling or at least what does your research lead you to believe oh it's, it's pretty clear without debate that these are uh statues that are not made by ancient africans but they're made mm. by the hands of modern man in the 1870s as a matter of fact it, these were fake and phony created in 1871 by modern conspirators that didn't know what they were doing. As, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. my, if you don't mind, I could just show the statues <laughs> so that people please. can- Please, I, I literally just, I was doing the same one. You go ahead, please, yeah. <laughs> okay, let me uh, let me find these and uh, and I'll show people so they can get an idea of the, the level of pathology and fraud that exists. So let me show you these folks. This is in the Cairo Museum and these are the statues in room 32 this is the forgery room these are fake and phony modern statues placed in the middle of the museum floor and so, so these have this. nothing me... to do should i oh, share your screen yeah are, are you not I'm seeing just... no no, no I'll, I'll, I'll share it now i need to add it to the stage let me just quickly share your screen i think oh, is, is oh. this it here uh you uh Let's... i'm doing it's, it's doing a screen share are you happy with that screen share yeah um but it but i have it on the actual statues mm, this comments so let me stop it and reshare it and see if if that'll work here sorry let me no eyes 
I'm not that familiar with StreamYard. Let's see. Okay, let's let's redo that. And let's try it this way. Because it is important for people to actually see. Indeed. Uh, let's see. No, let me retry it. Sorry. It's okay. This, uh, okay, let me add to stage. Is this working? You tell me. Are you happy with that one? It's showing your PowerPoint, yeah. but um, if you, if you, yeah, okay, but it's showing that, the actual it. PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's it. So, um, okay, so what you're looking at here? This is room 32. This is the forgery room, and it should be larger. You make it into presentation mode, but yeah, these statues are it. what I had saw in uh, in 1990. Uh, I don't know. What, yeah, so in the bottom right there, it should be uh, can make it into presentation mode. So it's it's large. Um, on my screen, it's showing full screen, but people oh, can. Um, yeah, on my screen it is. And um, so if you're able to... Okay, let me... I've got it on my screen. Should I? Can I just quickly put put it up on my screen quickly so people yes, can see that? Yes. Yeah? Okay. How's that? Tell me where you can see it. Okay, if you... Can you see what I'm sharing? Yeah, sharing. okay. I, I can see what you're you're sharing. Okay, so uh, that's a little different, but 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 those are the oh, same sorry. statues. Okay, yeah. so, so no, it's okay. So these statues here, they're in room 32. These are the forgeries. There's a long list of artistic rules that these violate. So the modern conspirators had a racial agenda when they when they when they presented these to the marketplace. Number one, there's a there's a long list. Number one, you never have two. Uh, you never have an individual seated statue with a high backboard during the pyramid age doesn't exist mm -hmm. so rahotep and nafred have individual uh backboards for their seat the seats are always low back chairs that's a fundamental rule that's violated uh and now by the way rahotep was the son of king seneferu and he was a general in the army and a high priest so we he would have had the best artists at his disposal so they don't change. They don't alter mm -hmm. the rule system, which they believe that was given to them by God. So that's one rule that's clearly violated. Another rule that's clearly violated, and this is what I began to document in, in 1990 when I first started to expose these forges. These are not remade statues. They are they are created from scratch. Also, you never mm -hmm. have the metal nature or the hieroglyphs by the head because it's a, it's a distraction. It's always down by the feet and ankles. Mm -hmm. That's another rule violated. Clearly. Also, uh, Nafret here, she has on a cloak that is not worn by women. That is not the right attire. <laughs> so this is a fundamental <laughs> rule that's violated. Not only that, if you were able to zoom a little bit, you'll see uh, with her, mm -hmm. if that's possible, you'll see that the freaky forgerers, they uh, they have her nipples showing and the rule is, yeah. is very obvious. You, that the nipples are either unseen or flat and unnoticeable, but the freaky mm -hmm. forgerers didn't know what they were doing. So this <laughs> is a this is a violation of a rule, plus an obvious additional violation. Both of them are way too light. You don't find anybody yep. anything looking like that during the pyramid age, and we can go on and on. Now, if you look at Rahotep, he's the only statue in the world with a gray mustache. There's yeah. no other statue in the history of Kemet with a gray mustache. Not only that, these are two of 11 statues in the world that have blue-gray eyes. All of the rest, the hundreds mm. of thousands, they're black eyes. But the blue-gray eyes, they show up in room 32, which is the forgery room, room 42 next to it, and there's, there's one at the Louvre in Paris. Other than mm. that, nowhere else in the world because it was the Egyptian Antiquity Service 
they were the ones responsible for this these fake and phony images. By the way, if mm -hmm. folks look very carefully at this as well, other rules violate. I'm going on a long list, but just a couple more. You notice that Rahotep has two clenched fists. And if mm -hmm. you look at it, the clenched fist on the left that's on his uh, that's falling off of his leg, notice that it's a closed fist. There's no mm -hmm. hole in hole the, for the fist. flail. Yeah, <laughs> for yeah, for the symbol of authority. So he never had anything in his hand. And you will never find, and I do mean never, find a clenched fist without an object of authority in it. They don't make empty gestures. Not only that, you don't see his navel. Mm -hmm. Show me another image from the pyramid age where the navel's not shown. Not only that, take a look at his kilt, his <laughs> white kilt. You don't see the kilt belt uh, protruding through the waistline because the forgers didn't know the rule system. They have the kilt lying on his lap. And we can go on and on. Not only that, but if you take a look, the 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 cheap paint didn't even dry evenly. The forgers used cheap paint, and so um, this is why. So when I saw these statues, I was amazed at modern forgers would actually peddle these statues to the world. And so uh, when the great Ivan Ben Sertima saw my work, he was stunned because all of the scholars before I examine these fake and phony images they just assumed that these were light-skinned so-called libyans in the middle of the african royal family during the pyramid age i said mm. absolutely not these absolutely. are fake and phony statues without any records of their discovery nothing no photographs of the excavation no reports so these are among the greatest forgeries in the history of ancient African archaeology. And I can go on and on and on, but the forgers didn't know what they were doing. They forgot to give Ra Hotel a wig or or some kind of of um yeah. something of authority. So he's got and by the way, why they, they have a white guy with with black with a black afro and <laughs> and, and blue gray eyes. He's a young guy, but he's got a gray mustache. It makes no genetic sense. Yeah. So anyway, but this is just some of it. If I can never bring my slides up. There's one other shocking image. No, right please right up. <laughs> bring them up, bring them up. Because I, I mean, I think you should okay. get your slides up because we can pull this one off the screen anyway. But I was going to say that um, I've covered this one on my channel a little bit. And actually, I, I was at the um, Berlin Museum, the Neues Museum, and that um, diadem that they've placed on Nofret, I always found very, very troubling. And I found an identity identical diadem this style that they've put on her this white diadem i found an identical one on a cypriot monarch so i was looking in the, i think it was in the mycenaean room so obviously they had that's where their knowledge base came from and they brought in a foreign diadem i just because i knew instantly when i looked at that, that is not a egyptian diadem this is something they've created i've only seen on the head of nofret so it was quite interesting i found that exact crown on a cypriot so i was like oh so that's what they're, they're classicists obviously this is why they had no idea about how to forge an egyptian statue <laughs> well yeah they, they they had no idea they didn't know the rule system so they engaged in uh incompetent forgery but there's many of them so some images mm. are completely created and doctored up in the 19th century which is the the uh the time in the century of fakes and others were altered and changed and the reason was racial but also commercial so they can peddle these to the public to buy allegedly authentic artifacts so this is when we have the great age of fakes that emerged and rahotep and nafret are among the the greatest of these forgeries so my book modern fraud stems from the widespread fraud and the de-africanization but it, the book will focus particularly on these forgeries in room 32 which is undoubtedly the forgery room in the cairo museum unbelievable um painted cartouches as well i mean well just painted hieroglyphs is that is this common because I, I i can't say that i've seen this often if ever in Kemet where it's not carved is that is that another red flag in your opinion for the uh, the glyphs there yeah uh, the glyphs just being painted with no carving. well the, and, and these were done by incomp incompetent forgers so they actually are slightly carved into the limestone but okay. um, they really don't make a lot of sense. Uh, the the uh, the inscription uh, and it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, and it's it's really crude as well. But it uh, this is not Fred's name on both the left and right shoulder. You yeah. don't see that. 
And you know what's interesting is that you don't see this kind of innovation. Yeah. These are unique, and they would never be unique. And um, I'm going to see if I could, um, if I can't bring these up, I'm going to, I'm going to email, I'm, I'm, I'm going to send this to you so you can post because the, the folks need to see another image that will be <laughs> yeah. absolutely stunning uh, once folks see it. So let me. Uh, okay. So you got to send me your slideshow and I can, I can um, present on your behalf if you're exactly. having trouble. Yes. Okay. okay. Brilliant. Right. Let's do that then. Okay. Let's do that. And also, I, I mean, I've the, one of the things I've come across is that normally hieroglyphs would be painted in color. Is is that right? They, they wouldn't be. Is right. there? A, yeah, the, the, they, would, the, they wouldn't be black and white, would they? It's it's unusual. The whole the whole thing is unusual. It's plain, it's simple, but it's totally incompetent, and it's unparalleled. And this is just the tip of the iceberg here because there's uh, it's much more. Uh, profound than that, but these are extraordinary forgeries, and they're mm -hmm. completely unique. And matter of fact, you know, those of you in the UK, you you can go to the British Museum, which I spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours at, mm -hmm. and you'll see some very interesting images. And there are also those reliefs of Rahotep, and you'll see. Now they're not statues; yeah. they're reliefs. Reliefs. But yeah. you can see with the relief, one of the reliefs of Rahotep, that all of the rules are followed, like a low back mm -hmm. chair. He has a wig and all of the things that you looks find like a black man. <laughs> oh yeah, he's an African without a doubt. Yeah, but here yeah. he's lost his melanin. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, so. and and actually, just to, and on that note, just to kind of support your point there, one of the things that I've found really edifying in in the work that I do with reconstructions is that there's actually normally really good phenotypic consistency between statues and reliefs. So someone will look someone who has a consistent facial appearance on their statues will look the same on their reliefs. It's not like there's not an inconsistency. So you won't find that someone's got, you know, really broad lips on their statue and then has suddenly has thin lips on their relief. It's always really consistent. So that would be a red flag to me instantly if I've got reliefs that don't look anything like the statues. Because a lot of these statues, you can literally just turn them sideways and it looks exactly what like what they've created on the reliefs. So that's just something on my on from my perspective that I'll find I find quite interesting to look at and compare. Well, absolutely, absolutely. Let's see. So let me. If you've sent it, let me know, and I'll quickly pop that open and get that on the screen. Okay. All right, no problem. Yeah, and this is this is where I started, and when I start, started to see the systematic modern fraud in Kemet, then I began to look more widely to to go south to Nubia and then further south mm. to Kush and notice they pattern up and down the, the, the Nile Valley. And so uh, this is this is activity in the 1800s, 1900s, and this is still going on. When I've done field work about a year and a half ago, this still continues right now. So this is just, and once people see a couple of these slides that I'm going to show, it's like these are forgeries, but the uh it's a pathological attack and uh mm -hmm. it's nothing better than to show images other than going out in the field and seeing all of this in um in real time in person then it becomes even more stunning when you go into tombs and temple environments and see that these people have an absolute driven agenda to erase and obliterate images it's and unbelievable that's what's what's been happening just to completely attack and obliterate Africoid images and somebody that says it ain't so has no idea what they're talking mm. about the evidence is very very clear I was gonna ask you what do you find more upsetting because this is one of the things that I've I've pondered about and I can't decide whether I find it more upsetting that they've created the fakes or the fact that in a field that's supposed to be academic things that are so blatantly obviously faked like Nefertiti and Rahotep and Nofret, things that have just got all of the hallmarks of being fake are just literally ignored by the Egypt. And they're still kind of held as being authentic representations by people who are supposed to be experts. And, you know, we're no longer in this time period where you kind of assume people will just be like outright racist, like Siegelman and, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, Flinders Petrie, you know, the, the, the people are supposed to be a little bit more enlightened for want of a better word now, but they still widely accept these fakes. 
and I've ne- I can never decide what I find more upsetting. What do you what what kind of bothers you the most in that area? Uh, well, the, 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 the people have no problem with it because it serves a uh, a racial and a financial agenda. Because when these fakes are in museums, people have to pay for entry, and mm. so um, there's a, a book by Oscar Muscarella, and uh, he worked for many years at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And uh, his book is called uh, Fake. I'm sorry, sorry, excuse me. His book is called um, uh, the, uh, the Lie Became Great. And he's showing in the collection one forged image after another, after another. And mm-hmm. these large collections from the British Museum to the Metropolitan Museum in New York to the Cairo Museum, and you name the institution, they have no interest in, in really investi- investigating where they purchased some of these items from because if so, they would have to re-examine their entire collection. And for those that think that, well, no one would do that. Well, when I was in uh, London in 1990, check it out, it's pretty obvious. I was glad to see what I was documenting and I saw an exhibit called Fake, The Art mm. of Deception. Yes, this was in 1990, fake the art of deception. And they had, among many fake and phony items, they had the uh, the statue of, a fake statue of Queen Tetashiri. Now, people mm. are not familiar with Tetashiri. She's the great ancestress of those who initiated the great 18th dynasty, where the great, uh, the, the great temple building uh, took place. And Tetashiri was displayed at the at the British Museum for 100 years. Because so was she 17th Dynasty? Because they they're yes. supposed to be quite yeah quite closely related to the 18th Dynasty, aren't yes, they? Yes, exactly. Yeah. She was the 17th Dynasty that issued, and so she was the ancestors that they looked up to. Tetashiri mm-hmm. was a very powerful queen, but the image of her in the in the in the in the British Museum, this was displayed for 100 years until 1990. This wow. was taken off the display and and pre- and presented as a nothing but a modern fake. The reason why it drew so much attention is because it's not only unique and unusual, but it clearly has the appearance of a modern white woman. <laughs> and it was the British Museum Egyptologists who knew that this didn't make any sense. Her wig was totally unique. Her mm-hmm. outfit was totally unique. And, and then the writing on the side, we won't call it metunature or hieroglyphs because it didn't say anything. It was modern garble. It, it was modern garble that didn't say anything. Mm-hmm. So it was always sus- suspected until they did the chemical test to show that this was clearly carved in modern times and then peddled to the world as some great queen. And But nothing looks like the Tetashiri forgery other than the Tetashiri forgery. So when you have something that is completely unique like that, then it's mm-hmm. uh, very clear that people should be very suspicious because you don't have these kind of totally unique images like that. It's like you said, if you see one ruler, then you get an idea of the nuances that the artist used to identify one person you Indeed. know, versus another. So this is very important for folks. Have you uh, sent me the know. presentation? Sorry to, <laughs> to cut you. Not yet. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm we looking. have to see these images. You're 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 wetting yes. our appetite a lot with, <laughs> with, yes. with some of these descriptions. <laughs> it's coming right. It's coming right now. I want to. I do. Before we move, I definitely want to show the Rahotep and Nafret images uh, a little more. Let's see. Do you want to try sharing again? Because I mean, we had success before, didn't we? It's just it's not letting you present. Because it gives you a few okay. share no, options. So when you let, let me, me try and let me through a bit, because okay. let me just quickly remove that. All right. So when you go to present, did you click on slides? Because it gives you some no, options. The, sli- the slides are not. They're not coming up with the slides. Yeah, they're Google. So don't do the slides. Just it's you're probably best off presenting. How many screens have you got? Have you got two screens or one? One, one. Okay, so you got one screen. So don't do screen then. You might but have to do. Should, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It. Uh, yes. Okay, I, I got an idea. I, I got an idea. I'm. I'm going to put this. It, it, it'll come up. 
Yeah, let, let okay. me. Uh, I got an idea. Well, I've got my mail open when you're ready to send it across. If you if you have any problems, I'll do okay. it this end. Okay. No worries. All right, no problem. so i think actually whilst you're doing that I'll, I'll just on that note um i think you're talking about um queen tetashiri and the fact that she was there in the british museum for 100 years so for 100 years she's in the british museum poisoning the mind of the general public and then when she's discovered and found out to be a fake there's no fanfare there's no I'm sure the media just totally ignore it. It's just quietly removed and put to the side and everyone just kind of carries on about their business. And that just seems to be the approach, doesn't it? With their, you know, when would they even entertain a artifact that's as controversial, for instance, as Nefertiti's bust? That's, I mean, that's, that's not Afrocentric or people of African descent who are disputing the, the authenticity of Nefertiti's bus. This is just normal historians. <laughs> when I say normal, I mean just like general historians, some of them actually European or Eurocentric themselves saying, no, this is definitely a fake. There's just too many red flags on this. We can't accept this. And yet there's there's nothing. There's like radio silence from the Egyptological community. And I think, um, you know, the Egyptians themselves, when I say the Egyptian antiquity, they worship that bust. The, um, the Berlin bus, they really do worship it. You can't even take photos of it. I went to the Noyes Museum, like I said, um, a few months ago, and they won't even let you take photos with your phone. They're that paranoid about it. Well, yeah, other than that exhibit, fake the art of deception, then uh, most people, if they didn't know about that exhibit, they wouldn't necessarily know about the Tedeschiri fake which is a high level forgery because uh, here you have one of the most important queens of the uh, 17th dynasty that issued in the temple age, so-called new kingdom. So you have a couple of these statues, uh, images now, I, I sent about five of them just so people can see the level of pathology and the nonsense about Ra Hotep. So you should- uh, Okay, I'll get that up there with me. This, this won't take me long, sorry. Mm. And uh, once people see these, they'll get an idea of this is what's happening. How have you sent them to me? Have you so? Have you what have you done? WhatsApp or or, G or Gmail? WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Okay, that's why I'm not finding it because I wasn't. I was looking at one place. WhatsApp. Yeah, much and, easier. And then <laughs> folks, yeah, then, then folks should know that when we look at the geography, this kind of fraud which uh, goes back to the systematic attack on African images in the, in, in the 1800s or 19th century, but they've continued. So you go south and you see the same thing in Nubia and also in Kush. And once folks see this, they will see that, wow, these folks are really uh, engaged in an all out angry assault, but an incompetent one as well. So, mm. so whenever you're able to put those up, yeah, I just wanted to give folks just an idea. Them, Actually, I shouldn't need to download them. I can do them straight from the screen. So let me do that. I'll just make sure there's no personal data showing. Okay. All right. So starting with this, can you see the Rahotep close up on the screen? Not yet. And let me know when you, when you want me to scroll through. Okay. Okay. So the next one. Oh well. Actually, if, if if you if you make that larger, folks can see the incompetence. You see all of the different uh, unequal, uneven color. You will never find this at all. Um, you'll never find that. Look at all of the uneven cover color mm -hmm. on his body. You see that. Also, the forgers. Look at his neck there. You see that white cord. Okay, look, look on the left here, right near, and nobody could identify what that gray object was until I finally cracked the code. That gray object is so crude, nobody can identify it. We used to, I used to call it a, a, the unidentified object. Now <laughs> it's clear that that, that gray pendant is, a, is supposed to be a heart or an Eve. 
Now look, so, but it's very clumsy and crude. Now look just to the left of that. You see that smudge of gray? Mm. You'll never find, this is sloppy. This is what children mm. do, not a master artist. So mm. if this if this white cord around his neck was legitimate, you would see all around white, you have gray and white, gray and white, gray and white. You mm. have a multicolored bead and not just one smudge. And then look at all of the uneven paint. And, 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 and then look at the, the, the gray mustache. He's the only one in the world. The blue gray eyes. He's the only one of 11 forgeries in the world. Mm. They didn't get a wig. Okay, so now if you, if you go to another image. No, so. Did you want to? Okay, yeah. yeah if, if you can switch and go to another image. I have. It's just maybe a delay on your side. I've already oh, switched. Okay. okay, another one. Yeah. Do you want to go to the one after this one, or yeah, can you see the pair of them? Yeah, we see the pair. So just keep scroll, scrolling. I okay, keep scrolling. Out. Okay. Yeah. So it's now the right side is showing right at right side. Keep going, or yeah, yeah. Keep going. Next one. Yeah. Okay. The geese. Okay, look at that. Okay, if you could enlarge that. Now look at the right side of his neck, folks. Do y'all see that there's paint? Dripping down. Go back. Uh, okay, so I, I'm. You, there's a delay, so I'm gonna. <laughs> you you want this one? <laughs> Sorry. You want the Raha tip? You go to one. So I, I don't know why it's, it's taking so long to show you. <laughs> okay, so there's paint dripping down the back of his neck, and um, what the hell is this? This is supposed to be divine art this is supposed to be art by the masters and yet they couldn't stop the, the paint from dripping the reason why this paint is dripping is because it's made by the hands of modern man and the forgerers the racial and racist forgerers they were rushing this image to market in 1871 or maybe <laughs> someone was coming and they had to rush in and to rush off how in the hell could this make any sense no one ever looks at this from the side, but I did. When I saw it, I was shocked. I said, wow, you'll never find anything like this anywhere in the world. Not in a million oh. years. <laughs> it's funny yeah, because this. there's not even New Kingdom artworks that have preserved their color like this. Like There's probably a handful, if that, of New Kingdom. This is Old Kingdom. I've never seen an Old Kingdom statue that has preserved its color. I can't think of one off head. I can't think of a single one. Can you think of any that are limestone um, old kingdom statue that has preserved its top coat? <laughs> it's some that have slipped uh, a vicious attack, but not many. Now, if you go to mm. the next one and even give people an even closer uh, image of the dripping paint. So, yeah, yeah there's a, <laughs> this is how absurd the whole thing is. And so I see it in uh, <laughs> Nubia. I see, yeah, it's it's funny. It's uh, can you imagine that they would peddle this to the world? Just look at the mm -hmm. close up there. It's obvious. This is absurd. And yeah, you're right. Uh, this is this is crude, clumsy, and incompetent work by racial forgerers. So this is this is what really spurred me to begin to look more widely at the systematic fraud. And I've actually been able to record video record and and, fo and photograph and actually keep some of the material at temple sites so you got forgeries like this but then you have the angry attack on african images even going mm. on now uh it was so shocking when i was out in the field about a little, little over a year ago that even the average visitors stopped at one of the temples just to observe they had never seen just someone hammering out images on the wall Usually tourists just walk by. They think that because they see scaffolding mm. and they see chisels and white Portland cement and water and they do it openly. And they just most people figure that these must be professional conservationists, professional restorers. But not that time. People there was actually a small crowd that stopped to see what the hell was going on. But this is how open and brazen it is. Just as crazy as this image looks here. And nobody else in the world has even said anything about this because they assume 
that these fake and phony images are somehow real. But there's a whole there, there's more than a dozen rules that are violated. And uh, in addition to the outrageous, crude, clumsy, and, and incompetent paint dripping down the back of his neck, I rest my case. Five so, five thousand year old dripping paint, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, 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 just one last image. Just one last image. Now you see how incompetent this is, as well as the the uneven paint. Now, if you go back to the geese, yes, and the same artist that couldn't stop the paint from dripping. He couldn't get the paint even. The same high-level artists were able to paint masterpieces. Mm. So now, okay, now folks, now take a look at the geese. They come from the same time period, from the same location, created by the same artists that would have created the tomb of Rahotep and all of the artifacts from the tomb of Rahotep. These are the, the geese of the place called Maidum. Maidun is a site in the northern part of the country. This is where Rahotep's original tomb is. Rahotep is a real historical figure, but the images you just saw of him are fake and phony. They've been made by the hands of modern man. Now, mm. the artist who painted the geese, geese are not the ones that created this fake statue. Just now, take a look at the Maidun geese. You see these six geese. And then we have two on the bottom there. These are masterpieces. Anybody can make out the specific details of the geese, the subspecies that they represent. This is a the work of a master painter. And you can see the contrast. Mm. How could the masters draw the Maidun geese with such precision, but they couldn't even uh, get the paint to dry evenly? or stop paint from dripping down the back of his neck. It makes no sense. And by the way, nobody in the world has ever found, because it doesn't exist, uh, detailed field notes or any field notes about the real discovery of this mm -hmm. and no photographs. And folks, understand something when you're doing research. I'm a primary researcher. The brother King was reading my bio. So I'm a historian, but a primary or firsthand researcher. Mm -hmm. So when somebody is in the field doing research or a team is doing research, here's the rules. You have to, in order to authenticate the alleged discovery, you have to do two things. There has to be in situ photographs, or in other words, photographs taken in the situation that you claim to have found the artifact. So in other words, you can't excavate a, a uh, artifact or a statue, let's say, and then clean it off and then take it over so you can stand it up and it looks like a nice picture. We don't trust that because we're not mm. there. That's not how mm. it works. All professionals know, no, we don't need a statue, take a photograph of a statue taken after you clean it off and you get it ready for a photo. We don't know where that came from. You mm. authenticate a discovery by taking in situ photographs. You're taking photographs exactly when you claim to have found it, a series of photographs. That's number one. Number two, there must be accompanying that a detailed written report. And that's the rules. Mm -hmm. If those don't exist, then a professional would never believe that this is authentic because how do we know? You have to have a, a whole chain of custody of this. Just like if anybody understands, um, you know, detective work, you can't just say that, hey, here's some evidence from the scene. How do we know? Where's your mm -hmm. photograph from where you say you got this uh, this item from the scene? You know, what's the details? And so nothing like this exists with our hotel. Anyway, but this is, these are the geese made at the same time. So I just wanted to um, to show that, brother, so that no anybody that says it can't be so, so it can't be so, uh, is shut down with that because I know you have a great audience, but you know, uh, this is, um, you know, the media. And so people mm. or things and then somebody who, uh, who has a hard time believing reality will say, well, somebody's paranoid. Nope. You just don't know what you're talking about because guess mm. what? Documentation beats conversation every day of the week. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for taking us through that. Now, I feel bad because I've sidetracked you completely <laughs> and just led you down the road of this thing that I wanted to discuss. But I want to now hand over to you to talk about the amazing work that you're doing on the ground in Kush 
and Nubia. Well, I know you 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 were in Nubia, but now you've been spending an extensive amount of time working in Kush. Um, I'd kind of just want to hand it over to you now and let you take it from where wherever you want to start. Okay, I appreciate it. So we still have the geese up right now. Sure. But, yeah. Um, let me um stop sharing that stage. Yeah. So my uh, I probably have to send a few slides to to Brother King here, but okay. Uh, in in the meantime. I appreciate the, the 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 intro. So that's where I got started, but the work continues. So I've been doing um, field work now in, in dozens of countries over the last 35 years or so. And my current work, I started doing work in Nubia. And Nubia is in southern Egypt and northern Sudan. And um, that's an amazing area in the past, but it's also an amazing area now. I have such a, a an affinity to our Nubian brothers and sisters. Now, some of you know that people talk about my Nubian king, my Nubian queen. We take people to Nubia. We have relationships with Nubian elders, with uh, with, uh, with with Nubian families. So we take people to, to immerse them in the culture of the Nubian people. And that's always a special experience. And I started to learn a lot about Nubia, but I also recognized that, wait a minute, in order to have a much more broad regional view of the entire Nile Valley, because it's one uh, eco valley, uh, it's, 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 it's one ecosystem in the Nile Valley, I had to continue to go further south. So I've done a lot of extensive research in Sudan. The Sudan is the heartland of ancient Kush. That's mm -hmm. where the great Kushites built mighty monuments. That's where they built hundreds of pyramids and mighty temples and colossal images. And so when we look at and I, and what I've been doing is um, helping to preserve and do what we can to save Nubia, ancient Nubia. We formed the Save Nubia project in 2011 because of the building of dams to that that have flooded parts of Nubia and now parts of Kush. And I recognize that in order to to learn about the origins of ancient Nile Valley civilization. I had to continue to go not down, but up south because the mountains and hills are in the south, going up south into Sudan and South Sudan and Uganda, uh, Uganda and northern Kenya um, and also southern Ethiopia. Because what I've been mm -hmm. most focused on now, uh, in addition to the work on Nubia, is finding and being able to document the origins of ancient Kush. So there are previous scholars that talked about Kush, but they called it Ethiopia by the Greek name. And by the mm. way, Ethiopia or Ethios means burnt face, black face, or kissed by the sun. It means a man with sunburnt skin. That's mm. what, uh, what, what Ethios means in Greek. So the word Ethiopia itself is a Greek word. It's not an African word. Mm. But, um, but the old name is Kush. So I've, I've been in pursuit of Kushology, the study of ancient and modern Kush now for some years. And um, that's important because here's how the order went in terms of the classical African civilizations. And by the way, we call it classical, not simply ancient. We mm -hmm. say classical because classical means the highest rank, the highest value, the highest class. Classical means anything that has permanent and lasting value, the model, the guide, the standard by which everything else is judged. So these okay. are classical African civilizations. The oldest is Kush and then Nubia and then Kemet. Kush, Nubia, and Kemet. The only way to document that is to do field work and to go further south. This is why I've been pursuing Kushology. I coined the term Kushology to, to define the field work. What field work? Going to pyramid sites, temple sites, tomb sites, ancient residential sites, and modern living communities. So this is so special to go to these remote areas where people still practice. This is what's extraordinary. They still practice their traditional life ways, even now, even now. And, and many Can of I just tell you really quickly? Because um, yeah. you've said a lot of really interesting things there, and I just want to kind of bring it back slowly, because I think it would be really beneficial at this point to define between Kush, Nubia, and Kemet, because there's a lot of obfuscation that takes place between those three terms. There's a lot of overlap and a lot of people get confused. A lot of the time we just hear that Nubia and Kush is the same thing. Anything outside, anything south of Kemet is Nubia. And there's, you know, they don't even use the word Kush. 
And then there's the, the conversation we had earlier about the fact that the first gnome of Kemet was called Tarseti, which is classified as Nubia. There's a lot of confusion, so it'd be good to hear from you what the distinguishing kind of points between those three civilizations are. Uh, yeah, that's that's excellent, my brother. Um, that's very, very important. There's a lot of confusion on this, and it comes from uh, Westerners, uh, particularly George Reisner. George mm -hmm. Reisner was from the Boston Museum, uh, you know, Fine Arts and Harvard, and George Reisner is somebody that has defined or misdefined Kush and Nubia. George Reisner had warped racial beliefs. The first, so he was in Egypt and Sudan foolishly looking for a white queen and couldn't find one. He was there from 1907 to 1932. <laughs> so Reisner, in his mad pursuit, he never found what he was looking for. But the further Reisner went south, and I have to mention him because he is the author of the confusion, along mm. with others who don't know, but he's been more influential. Reisner is uh, somebody, the further he went into Sudan, he was disturbed because he's dealing with not just black people, but black people who were jet black in color who mm. were responsible for Kush. And so this, this upset him. And Reisner said that this could not be the case. He's stunned by it. He's mesmerized by it. This can't be the case. They're not capable of building such a mighty civilization. This is his mm -hmm. a priori or his, his prior assumptions. So what he did was anytime Reisner saw something related to Kush, he said, well, that must be Nubia. So he's not a fan of anything African, but Reisner mm. was willing to at least admit that Nubia existed. But mm. he wasn't willing to go beyond that to say it's not just Nubia, but there's Kush further to the south. So he mixes and merges and mingles Kush and Nubia. There's no records whatsoever. There's no justification whatsoever that mm. Kush and Nubia are the same culture and they're interchangeable. Um, people have made this up, and then when they get caught, it's like so. So some some scholars, for example, not only do they just make things up when it says Kush, they say, "Well, that must be Nubia." Based on what? Documentation beats conversation. There's no documentation that Kush is another word for Nubia. And, and what the problem is, my brother, is that when you go south, all of that mythology disappears because the people are not Nubian. Um, Nubian. The Nubian, the great Nubian people, this again is northern Sudan, southern Egypt. But you go to middle Sudan, the, 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 the southern area of Sudan, and then into the new country of South Sudan, these this is part of ancient Kush. So is the, the same thing in uh, in um, the Lake Turkana area of Kenya, also in Uganda, also in the, in the Omo Valley. These people speak a Kushitic language. This is not Nubian. Uh, the Nubians are, as I said, they're great people today. They have a great tradition. It's Kush, and then Nubia came first. So the if people can imagine this, Kush is the oldest of these classical African civilizations centered in current-day Sudan, but it was a vast empire. But it wasn't just Sudan only. It's centered in Sudan. That's where the kings ruled from. That's where they built mighty monuments at but also imagine, folks, it's also a huge kingdom that expanded into South Sudan, into mm -hmm. Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, Sudan, Egypt, and across the Red Sea into Yemen and Saudi Arabia. This was a part of the Bash Kushite Empire. Wow. And um, there's various records that, that document this. Now, Drusilla Dungey Houston, who wrote 100 years ago her book, the wonderful Ethiopians of the ancient Kushite Empire and others, they've argued that Kush expanded all the way east to India. Um, but I argue that um, that's a great thesis. I think uh, there's some evidence pointing towards that. But what I know that could clearly be documented from my field research is that it's certainly the great Kushite Empire extending across the Red Sea into uh, Yemen and Saudi Arabia, but it's a vast empire. So Kush is a part of that. So eventually Nubia emerges later. Kush goes back mm -hmm. into the Stone Age. We don't have a date for it. As wow. the great Chancellor Williams said, and by the way, Chancellor Williams is a researcher's researcher. If you all are not familiar with Chancellor Williams, he wrote The Destruction of Black Civilization. 
and 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 it's not just based on 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 guesswork. Chancellor Williams in the 1950s, he did field research as a primary or first-hand researcher in 26 countries in Africa and among 105 different language groups. So he writes the destruction of black civilization. I was intrigued when I read it. I didn't read it as a history book. I read it as a manual to learn from and to use. I've got two guide. copies of that book, <laughs> just in case I lost one. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. And uh, for me, uh, we have some copies at, at the office that we we make available to people. But Chancellor Williams lays out what he called Ethiopia. He didn't use the original name of Kush, but he lays out a vast area. And this is very important because he's correct that in the southern part of Kush, Nubia emerges at least minimally about 3,400 before the common era. You have Nubia, uh, and then further down, not up, but further down north, Kemet mm -hmm. emerges a little bit after Nubia. So Kush uh, is distinctive from Nubia. Now, of course, they're all African people in the Nile Valley. They're all African people along the Nile using the same resource. It's, it's, it's one... Uh, uh, it's one Nile basin. There is overlap in culture. There's overlap in ritual. There's overlap in the representation of kingship. There's overlap in the use of names, but they are still distinct civilizations. So um, this is why it's important for me to define Kushology mm -hmm. and challenge people not to follow mainstream Egyptologists who are masters of misrepresentation and distortion. They don't know what they're talking about. Anytime you have somebody that they don't know anything about or any group, or oh, that must be Nubian. So Nubian has become a mm. code word for everything. Now, yeah. it, it, it doesn't mean that Nubia in antiquity is not high level and great. It is. It doesn't mean that the great Nubians today are not uh, the descendants of this great civilization. It just means that Westerners who don't know anything south of there, they just use anything just so they can uh, uh, get by. <laughs> And, and and move forward. So this is where the distortions take place. But Kush is yeah. first. And when people talk about black pharaohs of Kush, that's nonsense. First of all, no one talks about the white rulers of Rome or the white mm. or the white emperors of Rome or or, 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 or the Europeans in Greek. They should it's, though. What is the school? <laughs> it's the school. So, so yeah. why are you talking about black pharaohs and then say, well, they came around in the twenty fifth dynasty in order to imply that the first twenty four. We're mm. not black or not African. So we reject that because there's Africans at the very root of the civilizations in Kush, Nubian, and Kemet. And so okay. uh, we should know. I've got a few questions for you. Sorry. Because um, everything you said there, just a lot of bombshells and things that I was totally not aware <laughs> of. I guess the first one relates to the size of this Kushite empire, which obviously straight away that's kind of like ringing that's 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 a, a massive empire you're talking about because you're talking about something that had influence along the blue nile and the white nile because when you first started talking i thought okay you got to talk about the horn but then you talked about uganda and so we're talking about both where the nile splits along both stems of the nile you've got this single kushite empire and that's obviously spanning several language groups as well and several ethnicities so that kind of makes me think about going back to obviously Nubia and Kemet because I've always argued that I believe that Kemet was multi-ethnic in the sense that you had different language groups along the different sepats because they had different religions and stuff like that and that seems to be what's what's being reflected in Kush where you have different ethnic groups in the different regions but you have uh overarching kushite kind of ideology or empire or civilization sitting above that would you say that's an an accurate depiction what or what, what would be your kind of your thoughts on that um okay that's a very good point so i agree with you and here's something that can help you in in, in your work so i appreciate that observation is yes there are different ethnic groups that represented Kush, just like there's different, well, okay, now let's be very clear. I'm not mm. talking about racial groups because- No, of course not. Out there, I, I, I'll yeah. be very clear with that as well. They're, they're yeah. all, it's the same as like Ethiopia today, lots of different ethnic groups, 
but they're all black. Okay, so, yes, yeah. because, because you never know who's out yeah, there who can take that in a different direction. <laughs> so yes, there's different ethnic groups among the Kushites. Then, as now, there's different ethnic groups and different regional groups, different district groups in Kemet in antiquity. So, for example, mm. here's how we know that. The building of the pyramids in Kemet, uh, the information has been very interesting, is that they were built by work groups. The work groups were called a ZA. ZA mm. was just Z-A. So uh, the, the way they represented a ZA, it was uh, they came from different districts and they worked on different regions in Kemet and they worked on public works projects. And, the, and part of these public works projects were the mighty monuments such as pyramids. So there's records. So we know um, that different Zaz would work for three months and then on, pro, on, on, on public works projects, then they'll go back to their areas. Mm. And so um, it was a rotating system of, of Zaz that built pyramids. We have the records. We know when people worked, what days they had off. They were paid, no slavery, paid with grains of wheat, grains of barley, and with linen cloth. Mm. So it's interesting because when the Greeks came around much later, thousands of years later, later they didn't know the language. They, they called these groups phyli, which, which means in Greek, ethnic group. Literally, it means ethnic group. So the Za, these work groups from different regions in the country, the Greeks saw these as ethnic groups because they came from particular areas, particular regions um, of these 42 districts in Kemet, and they worked for several months and then they would go back to their areas. So you see that in the different areas, there's a standard, you mm -hmm. know, and the standard would be a, a sacred animal, a sacred plant, and every one of the districts or the a totem. Out, as you mentioned, yeah, a totem, absolutely. And mm. so every area was identified with the the important planet that in, in that area, the important animal, a, a totem. And this is how they they uh, organized these different districts because the, the way in which they created Kemet was to unite a vast area with mm -hmm. with uh, chiefs and regional chiefs under a king. So so and and this remained the re reality in the case um, of how they built the monuments. So the records that exist shows, actually shows that the Zaz were groups, work groups from different regions. And the Greeks, the Greeks as I just mentioned, called them finally, which means ethnic group, which is very insightful from the foreigners who made an observation. Same thing in Kush mm -hmm. today. So when I'm in, in the Omo Valley, Ethiopia, by the way, folks, the Omo Valley is one of the most special places in the world. You have over 40 different groups that are independent they don't care much about any other group whether it's the uh, the hammer or the Desinich or the kara or, or, or these different groups they continue to practice their cultural life ways now and they don't care about any other groups they really don't in some cases you are penalized literally mm -hmm. It's a big time problem if somebody even marries outside the group. So they don't care what anybody's doing. They really don't. The console, mm -hmm. they have their own, in the Romo, they have their own cultural ways, their own mm -hmm. uh, cultural practices and ideas, and they're not influenced by anybody else. They don't care about anybody else. And uh, mm -hmm. so you got these different groups that are separate. They're in the same region. And to get there, you got to go to some very remote areas to get to these places. So when I'm there, I'm meeting with chiefs, meeting with elders, and meeting with a group of people that they call heroes uh, who, who uh, defend and promote and protect the culture. So these heroes, uh, they're very special people in the society. They're so wedded to their own cultural life ways. It's not just in in uh, the Omo Valley in Southern Ethiopia. By the way, those mm. of you who are one of the Ethiopian brothers and sisters, the ones that you typically see, they're from the North. They're not from the South. The ones mm. in the South are linked not so much to the people in the North, those in the Omo Valley in the Southern area, the Southern nation, nation nationalities and peoples region. And uh, they're linked to the people genetically linked and linguistically linked to South Sudan, Mm -hmm. Kenya and Uganda. 
So, for example, the Karamoja, people may not be, but the Karamoja uh, in Uganda, the, the Buganda, is stunning the cultural practices that still continue. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people cannot tell you about origins that go back thousands of years. They can tell you about their current practices. So when I show them images from the distant past about the whole area of Kush, uh, they're able to identify and articulate exactly what the ritual it is, who the people were. And these are images that they've never seen before, but it's so wow. familiar to them because it has not been a lot of change in the area. It really has not just so just I, I just want to pause you really quickly i want to give a shout out to black rampage too who has given a 9.99 donation it's an excellent scholarship and left the salute for you there sir <laughs> so thank you very much and angel um Ossi mensar who has also left a 4.99 donation now just before you move on because you raised a really interesting point there regarding the um showing them images and then instantly being able to culturally identify with those images. Can you give us an example? So we kind of get an idea of what you mean. Yeah, uh, and, and sorry folks, some of the technical difficulty, but but I'll find a way to show you a couple other images. Okay, I'll, I'll give an example. Uh, if, if anybody's in uh, Paris or France, uh, give a shout out, but, but guess what? Okay, so in the Louvre, in Paris. This is supposed to be some of the best scholars in the world. So they say. Mm. They don't know what they're talking about when it comes to the classical African civilizations. So there's an image in the Louvre, and I'll, I think I might have to send it to you, brother, but uh, there's a Please. there's a relief in the Louvre, and, and the people are identif identified on the relief, they're identified as Nubian. And um, I found that quite strange because Across the forehead are the cultural markings. Now we don't call mm -hmm. them uh, we don't call it scarification because it has a negative connotation. So it's better just to call it cultural markings. All over the region they have cultural markings. Mm -hmm. And a competent scholar can tell one group from another based on mm -hmm. not just the jewelry, but the cultural markings, which links them to the group. And the cultural markings of this relief in the Louvre, there is six horizontal lines across the forehead, and mm -hmm. they're identified as Nubian. Guess what? That's not a Nubian cultural marking. You have mm -hmm. people in Dongola, for example, in Nubia, they have lines under the eyes for cultural identification. Mm -hmm. But the cultural marking across the forehead is no debate. This comes specifically from South Sudan. And so they're mislabeled. So mm -hmm. um, in South Sudan, the people that have these kind of cultural markings are the Nuer. And the Nuer um, is very distinctive. Sometimes it's five, five lines, six lines. Sometimes there's a, there's a dip in the middle, almost like a, uh, not, not a, a, an obvious V, but something like a V shape. So mm -hmm. you can begin to distinguish one group from another by the cultural markings. So those images in the Louvre, we'll, we'll get a chance to share with, with folks, they're not Nubian as they're falsely identified. Remember what I said a minute ago, people are just using the term Nubia without any mm. rhyme or reason to it. Uh, it just like means they, black though, doesn't it, really? Whenever it's something, because it, it can be Egyptian and it becomes Nubian on the fact that they can't, exactly. it's too black for them to accept that it's Egyptian. So they just call it Nubian on that basis. Yeah. That, that's that's an excellent point. Absolutely. Oh, it must be Nubian based on what? Looked indigenous mm. in Kemet, as far as we can see. So the culture markings on the forehead. Um, so I, I have slides to show that these are not Nubians. They're New Air from South Sudan. And some New Air have crossed over the border to uh, the Gambela area of Ethiopia. But also I learned even more intimately. The, the I spend time with a lot of the Dinka and the Dinka have the cultural markings. And, mm -hmm. and the Dinka can tell if this person is from Rumbek, Euro, Wow, uh, they know. 
or for, uh, they know the region based on the culture marking because it's not only the four, four lines, five lines or six lines, but how far it goes towards the ear. Is that specific in detail? This is not a Nubian trait or characteristic. So the foreigners masquerading as some world experts, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't have any idea about Kushology. They're just making up things following George Reisner. And, uh, and and other nonsense. So that's what makes it very clear when you see the culture markings, and not only the culture markings, but guess what else we see in the artifacts? You see the actual items that they're bringing as they trade. You know, it could be um, giraffe, it could mm -hmm. be leopard skin outfits, or people wearing the important, um, the, the ostrich feather. So the ostrich, mm. feather, by the way, the ostrich is an African bird. So when you yes. see the ostrich in classical Kemet, which means ma'at or divine law, guess what? You see the ostrich being used even now in cultural mm. ceremony and ritual worn by who? By chiefs, by important elders, by heroes, by kings. And they and only special people can or special people in the family during a funeral ceremony, marriage ceremony. And that's when they're worn by the highest and most respected officials. So we see the paraphernalia and we see the the cow, um, the cowhide loins that they wear clearly from the, the southern area, um, you know, like in South Sudan or the eastern part of uh, of um, of Ethiopia in the, 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 the Gambela area. Or you see it in northern Kenya because uh, the government doesn't control those borders. The local people do. So the people are pretty fluid as they're traveling back and forth. And I'm glad to say that we've been pretty fortunate to be able to do the field work, to spend time among the indigenous people and learn from an inside perspective. Uh, uh, I'm going back to South Sudan to continue my work with the Nuer, the Dinka, the Shiluk, the Mandari as well, mm -hmm. with their distinctive cultural practices that link them back to Kush. My brother, the people they know about Kush, but they don't have all of the they don't have a lot of details. Like they like yeah. in South Sudan, there's Kush Airlines, there's Kush Bank. So they know. So when I'm coming to talk about Kushology and to go deeper, they're so excited. And this is very important that the work's done now because of the modern age, um, the flooding of Kush. I have some mm. uh, images that is shocking that a dam was built that has flooded a 108 mile long area of ancient Kush. Are you going to be sorry to cut you off really, just really briefly? Are you go, are you going to send me the presentation or? Are we? Yeah, I'm happy to have you chatting here, um, but okay. I feel like you've got some visuals that you had stored that you wanted to share. Um, yeah, let, 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 let me that yes. out. I want to give a shout out to Mr. Curious, who's given a four ninety nine. He just said no message, just high appreciation for you both, and a massive fifty dollar donation from Stephen Osinoa, who said King Mono brought Master Yoda on to use the Force. <laughs> so you're getting massive appreciation here. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i almost feel bad cutting you off because you're i know you're in a flow there um was there any because no. i mean you've spoken about the um you've spoken about the work that you're kind of doing with the dinka and in kush i'd be really interested to know in terms of excavation and preservation or even discovery of artifacts what what kind of what what kind of secrets or what's there because a lot of people don't even know you know you, you just want to go to that region of the, you know that region of the world you're going to go to you may you might venture as far south as nubia and kind of stop there no one even thinks at least i'll speak for myself no one even thinks to go further south into south sudan you don't think that anything's there you think that Kush is something that used to exist, but it's almost like talking about Atlantis as this place that <laughs> no longer has, you know, any anything. Can you kind of like, yeah, it would be nice to get get a bit of a picture in regards to what what has been preserved, what has been saved, and what's being uncovered at the moment in that region. Yeah, I appreciate it. So when so when we were in like uh, Sudan and uh, in Kemet. And even the northern part of Ethiopia, you have a you have monuments that are 
made of stone, whether it's limestone or red granite. Uh, you have items and powerful monuments made of stone. But as we go further south into mm -hmm. Kenya and the southern part of uh, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, Uganda, you don't have as many monuments because a lot of these uh, ancient monuments were made out of organic material, like mm -hmm. mud brick, for example. They're not made out of stone, so they don't survive over time. And so uh, as I go south, the work moves like a south, meaning in, like, say, South Sudan and that area mm -hmm. and, and Omo Valley in Ethiopia, the south, southern part, the work shifts from doing work at monuments to uh, now being in the, the actual living communities to um, learn about the rituals and the ceremony, the cultural practices, to learn about the language connections. And... Um, that becomes more and more important because of the fact that you don't, because things made out of organic material, they don't survive. But mm -hmm. what is very important is the names that survive that are still being used. People still, the people in these areas speak a Cushitic language, for example, branches mm -hmm. of ancient Kush. And then you have groups like the Kanso. Um, these are great builders. They build on terrace uh, in Southern Ethiopia. The, the Kansu, um, very, intriguing group but one of the things about the consul for example is that they they name their children uh, based on their rank in the family kusho kushe uh and you know just different names of the variation of kush and this is for male young girls and boys they're naming them uh on the, the uh, on the variations of the name kush itself which is very important because uh, these are part of the, the old ancient Kushite empire. They still still speak a Kushitic language. They practice rituals and ceremonies that are very unique and indigenous to the region. So mm -hmm. like they use the ostrich feather consistently. They mm -hmm. use leopard skin outfit for rituals and ceremonies. I'm, I'm getting these again. It was so many slides. I couldn't send them all, but I'm going to, I'm sending some now to you. I think this would be a good representative. Um, Let me see what I can pull up. And um, so, so, so this is what people need to know is that the practices have continued, although people don't have a memory of the distant past, but they definitely can tell you what their observations are today. Like, for example, anybody that knows a little bit about Kemet, the greatest law was the law of Ma'at. So Ma'at mm. is represented as a goddess with an ostrich feather. And sometimes it can just be the ostrich feather itself without the goddess. But it represents truth, justice, righteousness, harmony, balance. And I wanted to know why the ostrich bird. There's so many birds. Why the ostrich? So mm. in my field work, I have a standard question among many questions. Why do you use the ostrich? And they give mm. intimate. It, it, they have so many details about the ostrich that it, it seems as though they have them almost like in a park where they're making just clinical observations. And so how, did, how could they know that? They say, mm. you know, and, and the ostrich doesn't fly, but it has tremendous, they, they say it's a humble bird. It's a wise bird. The ostrich, they love the feather. First, they'll just say, because the feather lasts a long time. Yeah. yeah but what else? Then I have to go <laughs> deeper. Then they talk about the characteristic that the ostrich knows how to calculate the rain. It just runs and out. How can it outrun the rain? And they say that when there's a fire, the ostrich knows how to, so the, 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 the ostrich, this is wisdom, the ostrich clears an area of brush so that the small um, baby ostrich can, can be in an area where it's mainly dirt, there's not brush around to help protect them. Then they say the ostrich runs with great speed to a water source and the ostrich brings back water. This is amazing. Bring back water in his wings. And, and they say the ostrich knows exactly how to calculate. And it's amazing. And, and then they, you know, to keep the, you know, small ostriches uh, wet and safe from the, from the fires. And it's not just one group saying this. It's mm. various groups. And no group is influencing the other because what's amazing about these groups, like, for example, in the Omo Valley or the southern area of Ethiopia, they don't care about anybody else. They don't borrow anybody else's ideas or beliefs. They literally mm. don't care about anybody else. So it's not like these are 
ideas that are being cross-pollinated, not at all. These are mm -hmm. observations. They have observations about the leopard and the ostrich. And these are rituals and ceremonies that go back to classical Kush, classical Kemet, classical Nubia, and people are still utilizing these symbols of, of high level rituals today. And that's mm. what we find um, that's very important because even though some monuments don't survive, the cultural practices still do. And that's what, okay, I'm gonna send this in one second. The practices no, still do, what's so amazing. Um, let's so see. Brilliant. Um, we've got 340 people live right now. So, yeah, um, very interesting. Obviously, everyone's really interested in what you have to say. Um, just a donation from Macy. He's given four ninety nine. She hasn't left a comment, but she always gives very generously. So I really appreciate that, Macy. Um, and a donation from HD, um, two euros, who said, thoughts on green Sahara theory and why it's hidden. Do you feel like it's hidden or is it something? I feel like the Green Sahara is being more widely accepted now um, because of, I think there's been a, a lot of theories that have kind of um, started to be surfaced um, about other civilizations. Like, I don't know if you've heard of like Gobleki Tepe and, and all of those other. And so the Greens, a lot of them rely on this younger Dryas theory and the the green sahara so this is something the amazing thing is this is something that people of african descent have said for a long time about the sahara and were ignored but now there's <laughs> su other supporting theories now they all accept oh yeah the, the, the sahara was you know you have eurocentrists telling you oh the sahara was green six thousand years ago I was, oh so you agree with that now that's that's convenient isn't it <laughs> so go on uh, well it's it's uh i appreciate the question the the it's, it's not a debate the yeah. Sahara was green. Back in the late 80s, I worked on a NASA-sponsored project. That's the uh, Space uh, Administration in the U.S. So it, it was a NASA-sponsored uh, project. And the goal was to look at the, the climatic and environmental history of Africa going back as far as possible. So we're able to look at a 300,000-year weather uh, history and and uh, uh, um, in Africa, and there's always uh, a, a dry period and a pluvial and wet period. There's there, there's there's uh, there's wet episodes, for example, like at a uh, 212,000 years ago, 145,000 years ago, uh, 100 uh, and, and uh, sorry, 141,000 years ago, 45,000 years ago, and the Sahara was a plush green area up until maybe the last 10,000 years, maybe 12,000. And the way we know that is several sources. Mm -hmm. You could see the weather patterns um, emerge where there's wet periods. And what constitutes the evidence for that is numerous things. Uh, one is the plant remains because certain plants will only grow in a, in a, a, a pluvial or wet environment. Whereas you have other kind of plants that can strive in a in a in an arid or dry area, like a, like in the cactus family. So mm -hmm. in the Sahara, we have uh, clearly there's plant remains that indicate it was a plush area for quite some time. From the from from the when I say plant is botanical, is the technical term. So the botanical evidence, the tree ring evidence, because the rings of a tree will tell you dry periods and then wet mm. periods. So, so there's tree ring evidence. There is presence of animals that only would survive and thrive in a wet environment. And also there is paintings in the Sahara in different places, mm. whether in Algeria and other places, which clearly indicate people were there. You see the images, you see the flora, the plants and animal flora and fauna around them. And the mm. fact that the people were there because it was an environment that was able to sustain populations. And we know that because of the rock paintings. So the Sahara mm. was very, very wet, um, but there's been weather changes. It had nothing to do with people, it's just how weather is. There's wet mm. periods, 
there's dry periods. So the wet Sahara is pretty well documented. One other thing related to that, I was, I think one of the things that surprised me by looking at the data is that you can look at the, um, the aerial photography or the remote sensing data when you can have mm -hmm. a bird's eye view of the land. So when uh, the, the space shuttle and things go up, there's ground penetrating radar that allows you to see below the surface and you can actually see distinct, I'm sorry, extinct, um, um, extinct riverbeds. You can see the mm. channel very clear. And the one that, that was most intriguing to me was the Wadi Hauer. The mm. Wadi Hauer, Hauer, W-O-H-A-R, Wadi, uh, W-A-D-I, Wadi Hauer branch of the Nile. So the Nile River, we know it's in East Africa, but the Wadi mm. Hauer branch expanded across Africa and emptied into and, the Atlantic. Yeah. You yes. know, you can see this from the uh, from the ground penetrating radar. So a lot of areas that are dry today, the Sahara and the Sahel, they were mm. wet um, not I, that long ago. And you know what's amazing? Because I was actually going to bring that point up when you started responding to this, because I think there's this perspective of a uh, very sudden drying of the Sahara. But I think someone actually, the same person who left the donation said, a thousand years ago, the Sahara was shown as green on maps. Now, whereas I, I might not agree that it was entirely green, but I do believe that the, the state that it's in at the moment is a lot worse than it was maybe even a couple thousand years ago. So I think there has been a, a drying period. And the reason why I say that is because we've looked at old maps as well. And if you look at the, the oldest maps, they show a, a river network across the across africa so you actually see connections between the niger and the nile or, or, or very nearly almost connecting and that also kind of goes hand in hand with the the fact that the west african crocodile um the crocodile sucus is found along the nile so you've got the two species along the nile both the nile the nile crocodile but also the west african crocodile which is very common in the nile suggesting that there was perhaps a period of time when you had a connecting river network between both sides so it's just it's really interesting because i don't think there was a sudden oh everything's dry now and everything's cut off actually you it looks like things have gotten drastically worse um quite suddenly in in more recent years even though it did dry out but i think there was still existence of perhaps more rivers and things that it looked different to what it looks like at the moment at least which kind of goes hand in hand with some of the stuff that you're doing with the along the Nile at the moment. With the, the you spoke earlier actually about the flooding, the deliberate flooding of the um, plain, the Nubian and the Kushite plains that is taking place at the moment in Sudan. Um, it would be good to hear some more information about that because I don't think my audience are aware of what's currently going on in Sudan, and it'd be good to hear from you. Okay. Yes. And then I'm gonna I'm sending this right now. I'm making sure it's the right slides. Yeah, the, the flooding has been devastating. So uh, there's been a systematic attack on the artifacts. So it's hard to argue about African greatness without evidence. Remember, documentation mm -hmm. beats conversation every day of the week. So there's not only been an attack with, with uh, the age of fakes and forgeries, but the more, a more recent addition to the attack on the African civilizations of mainly Kush and Nubia is the building of dams. And these dams are along the Nile River from southern Egypt into Sudan, and there's been uh, dams built in Ethiopia. They've had a devastating impact. Now, it, somebody might say, yeah, but dams create a hydroelectricity to help improve life in theory. But the World Commission on Dams said that no dam should ever be built unless the local affected communities agree to the project and are part of it at every stage. And that's never happened. Uh, these projects have been dumped on them and they resist. Mm. Local people re exist because they know from the Aswan High Dam in 1970, this was supposed to help the Nubians in southern Egypt, and it is not. Anybody goes to that area, they know that the Nubians are still at the bottom uh, level as they were before the Aswan High Dam was built 50, you know, uh, since 1970, 50 years mm. ago. It has mm. been no change. The new even in the area where the Nubians are most populous, in Aswan, they you go to the market there or the souk, and where are the Nubians? They're, they're not there. 
the newbies are struggling. And by the way, it's been an attack on their culture. So not only have they been, there's no economic benefits to them for the dam, they're not better mm-hmm. off. But even in addition mm-hmm. to that, they, they, Egypt and Sudan, neither country recognized Nubia, Nubian as, a, as an official language. They don't recognize mm-hmm. it as a language. So it cannot be, and it's not even taught in school. So they learn Arabic, and then the next language is English, not Nubian. If you, if, mm-hmm. So Nubian can be spoken at home, but not in school because it's not official. That's the kind of problem we have. But so that's taking. So when 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 groups are displaced because of dams, the Nubians have been displaced. The Aswan High Dam displaced about a hundred and twenty thousand Nubians, and there's at least mm-hmm. thirty nine villages underneath Lake Nasser, or they call it Lake Nubia, the largest man made lake in the world underwater. So that was in 70. Then if we go south to Sudan, when I was there, and I'm sending these slides, hopefully these are all the ones you need. So it would be through, um, through WhatsApp. Okay, but, but also in 2008, there was the building of the Meroway Dam. And I mm-hmm. went there before this dam. dam was so well, just, just really quickly, and, where did you send and to? Before it flooded 108 miles area. Sorry, Professor. Where did you where did you send to? Because I've checked my WhatsApp. I haven't got anything new. Are you sending it somewhere different, or? Um, I'm sorry. sorry. Can you repeat that? So, where are you sending me these files? Did you what? say you were sending files to me? Sorry, I thought you said you were sending files to me. WhatsApp. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not getting the updates. So, just bear with me. They are not coming through. Let me check my my web WhatsApp. Let me check my phone. <laughs> Sorry, because it would be good to be if these were actually coming through. Yeah, they they um they're coming through WhatsApp. Yeah, yeah. I'm not I'm not getting. How, what have you sent so far, other than the Rahotep stuff? Have you sent a lot? I don't know if you heard that question. So other other than the Raho Rahotep stuff, have you sent a lot more? Because I that's the last thing I've received from you. Ah, oh, there we go. It's just come through. I've literally just listen. If anyone thinks I'm lying, yeah, sorry, bud. <laughs> that's my phone going crazy. It has been bottlenecking for some reason, and I've just literally received about a hundred images from you. You've been sending them to me for ages. So sorry about that. That's really annoying. I don't know why I did that. That's <laughs> yeah. really, really irritating. Hey, hey folks, uh, well, brother, you know, <laughs> the, the technology works when it works. When it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But there's always ways around it. So, um, yeah, so I um, am sending these to you because I'm not, I don't know okay, why. I have not everything now. Open. That's really irritating. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, now, <laughs> okay, now, 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 now so these images are not, uh, as I look at them, they, they did not come in any particular order. So you can just take whatever ones and we'll just kind of go from there. But these are making the point about the flooding of Kush. It's one of the greatest tragedies to flood one of the greatest archaeological regions in the history of the world. Uh, so whenever you um, come up, okay, now, now uh, that image there of Africa, that's where I'm, uh, if you go back. Um, okay, I'll go back, sorry. Yeah, the um, that map image. There's a delay between us, so just talk through. Don't worry, we'll, we'll catch up with you. Okay. So, so, so that map image there, where you see the area kind of in the northeast African area, that's where I'm doing the work on Kushology, the systematic study of ancient and modern Kush. So that's the area that I mentioned um, where I'm doing the work, and and uh, this is part of ancient Kush. So it's a vast area. It's one of the most important regions anywhere. So it's beyond Kemet. It's beyond Nubia. It's a much broader Kushite region. So that's the area that I've been um, most concentrating on since 2008. And then if you continue to move on, uh, whatever image comes up, I'll discuss it. So it's the newer next, I think, yeah. So it's talking about the showing the newer okay in the okay all right so um if there is one um okay that that image there 
that's the one that I was referring to earlier, and that's in the Louvre. And there are, in the Louvre, there are three sets of um, of people there on this relief. And let me um, can I, let me can I just me. ask you a question actually about this relief really quickly, because I'm yes. looking at these people at the front, and that hairstyle with the plait down the side, the kind of gap mm -hmm. and the hair down the back, that. Is that Libyan? Am I right in that assumption? Okay, yes, you're, you're correct. So those on the right, those are from those people are from Libya, and um, and the reason I say that just really quickly, yeah. I'll let you go on. But the reason I say that really quickly is because I was having a debate online with another YouTuber um, who was using. I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, Mulatoni Mulatoni's reproduction of the tomb of Seti where he's got the Egyptian, the Nubian, the Libyan, and the, it's one oh, of the yeah, table, yeah. table of nations, one of those ones. Yeah. So it's a really, yeah. and I said, it's really rubbish. And I said, the Libyans didn't look like that because they've got this exact Libyan hairstyle, which is clearly an African hairstyle. This is clearly a black person with African hair, but they've got it depicted as a white person with this hairstyle that makes no sense. <laughs> Right. <laughs> on a, a European or on a white person's head. So I'm glad you've got just shown this relief because this can just show my entire community. This is what Libyans look like. This is what that hairstyle is supposed to look like when it's on an African. So sorry, that's I just want to quickly jump in and say that. But so <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> okay, that's good. So uh, all right. So as, as you all can see, this is written in French, and it says starting at the top. It says from right to left the chiefs or the kings of the country of Libya, countries of Libya, and they say of Nubia and uh, Syria, Palestine. So mm -hmm. from right to left, Libya, yes. Nubian, yeah. and then Syria, Palestine. The problem is these are not Nubians. This has nothing to do with Nubian. And you take a look. So I'm talking about the middle group. See the three guys in the middle? Mm -hmm. This is a typical Kushite hairstyle. You'll see it in South Sudan. Now, if you so this so, so this is incorrect. The people in the Louvre don't know what they're talking about. They're just saying, "Oh yeah, it was, must be new because they don't know." Now, the image after this one shows a close-up of these African men in the middle, and I want to show the cultural markings where those those uh, culture markings across the hor the horizontal markings across the forehead clearly indicate. Yeah, that one there. See, there's an arrow, and you see that these horizontal marks here across the forehead. This this clearly indicates that they're not Nubian. Look at the hairstyle, the plaited hair, which is typical. You see it today in South Sudan, and you mm -hmm. see those um, markings across the forehead. This place is much further south than Nubia, and can you imagine? the thousands of people that go into these kind of institutions every single day, being misled, misinformed, misdirected by people who are supposed to be the world's best, the best at what? Mm. Of distortion? Because it's certainly not the best at accuracy. So, okay, now, there's another image after this. L let me show people where this... And just, uh, yeah. I just want to quickly give a shout-out to Soul Poster, who's given a $10 donation. He said, Nigerian in Texas much love great presentation thank you my brothers <laughs> and then uh, another really big donation um from dishon dishon willingham who says great work as usual and he just left it at that so thank you so much to everybody who's joining us on this live having a great time and appreciate the positive feedback that we're getting here um so i can't get through all of the comments as you can see we've got a lot to cover today <laughs> so um <laughs> I don't want to slow you down anymore. Let me move to the next image. Yeah. Oh, and, and by the way, folks, um, you can get my book, A History of African Civilizations, uh, A History of African Civilizations, and okay. um, I present uh, some of this this work, History of African Civilizations. Okay, now, yes, yeah, so that one, the, the tomb of uh, General Hormhead, this is in Saqqara. You see the outline of his tomb, and then you see a photo of it. Now, if you go to the next image, I want to show you some uh, other images of these Kushites from the south. 
and then you can see the culture markings even more cleverly and uh, specifically presented. So the image after this then would be the close-up from the tomb. Now this is Hormheb, you see here, he's receiving his gold collars. Why is he receiving the gold collars with those assistants on the left and the right of him? Because of the fact it's a lifetime achievement award. Uh, Hormheb mm. was a bad dude with tremendous <laughs> clout and a great track record of service. So this is Hormheb. Now, moving forward, this is Hormheb. This is his tomb outline that I've shown you. So the next image is that in Hormheb's tomb, he's showing men coming in from different areas or different regions. So I want to show you that uh, who the people are, because they certainly are not, uh, they're not Nubian. And so uh, after Hormheb, you'll see the tomb where there's a, a number of men. So there's a number of men, there's a line of men on the top register and also the, the, the middle register and the bottom is three registers here and they're moving from left to right. Now, if you, if you look at the next image, it's a close up of these men from the South. You know what people call them? The, um, if they don't mislead the public and say Nubians, they say that they are Nilotics. Mm. Nilotics, meaning they're from the Nile. Well, what group? Well, we don't yeah. know. We're just going to call them Nilotics. Well, we mm -hmm. don't have to be general like that. We can call it. So, okay, now take a look here and you see um, these men. Okay, so those are cultural markings. And if you take a close look, notice the man who's like, uh, he's in the middle. There's two men to his right, two to the left. You notice that you see the red horizontal markings. These are fresh cuts. That's why it's red. So what they would use is a razor. This is a classic uh, um, Kushite initiation into the group. So the man has the um, he has the uh, the red across the forehead. And if you count it's six across the forehead, and then mm -hmm. you can see the other men more subtly. There are red markings, not quite as red, because what the artist is showing that those marks have healed. And so you have the cultural hairstyle. You see the cultural markings. You can see it very clearly in the man on, in the middle. And in fact, brother, if, if you can uh, get, get the guy on the far left uh, a yep. little more, you can see the this a guy. It's the fifth guy on the left. You can see his red markings very clearly as well. And then if you take a look at each one, there's different stages of healing. Um, yeah, there's, there's, okay, you got it. Yeah, there's, there's different stages of healing. That's why you see more red than other um, red, because guess what? This is new air. These are new air people. So if you go to the next one there, and you'll see modern new air. These are not Nubians as identified in the Louvre. People are not aware of African cultural practices. That's why they just make up make up things that don't make any cultural sense so the mm -hmm. next image is uh is a modern new air uh person so here's a modern new air and then there's a another person too but you would see you see the marks across the forehead this is not nubian new, new air they're from south sudan mm -hmm. some across the border and uh they're in gambella but mainly south sudan and there's no debate, there's no discussion. And why would someone just make it up and say, oh, they're newbie? Because they don't know. So they are Egyptologists mm -hmm. who are misguided. And they just make statements about the Southerners and say that they're Southerners or they're Nilotics, but they cannot identify by group. They can't identify by tribe because they're just making things up, hoping that uh, mm -hmm. other people in the public and other scholars will believe this misinformation. Now, if you, if you go to one other image of a new air, um, see this one here? You see the cultural markings? You can count, folks. Hmm. You can count. There's six. So yeah. there's no debate. There's no discussion about it. We know exactly. I know exactly where they're from because that's why I'm, you know, pioneering in Kushology. And you can only know if you're in the field. You have to be out in the field because photographs are not going to do it because you need to see how far the marks go towards the ear. And if someone's taking a picture, they may not know that kind of nuance. But... Uh, if you're in the field, you know the nuance because the elders and the chiefs, they're telling you the details. 
And this mm -hmm. is how it is that, so you can tell the difference between Nuer, Dinka, Mandari, these groups. So these are the people who are depicted in a lot of the images. They're from Kush. So Kush has been separated from its origins. Kush is, part of Kush has been completely flooded. This is one mm -hmm. of the greatest cover-ups. The flood is it's underneath a huge lake now. You know, can we just, this, this is I want to talk about the flooding just briefly because, um, I think sometimes it's good to get these things in perspective because I think it's, I think we, we, we're used to the fact that it's happened, but also there's so many things people, a don't understand why it's happened, B what benefit it served and C what we've lost as a result of these places being flooded. So I been doing some re I was doing some research around the um the movement of Abu Simbel because I was I was a bit skeptical about it. But anyway, I'm not gonna go into that right now. But um I was doing some research around it and in that I watched a few documentaries and I read a few papers and they all agreed actually when they built Lake NASA they wasn't even speaking about they were speaking about increasing the floodplains so they could ha have more arable land. That was the reason they used they weren't even using at least in the, the the contemporary stuff, I think it might, I don't know if it's changed now, but when they first built it, they wasn't even talking about the hydroelectric aspect of it. They were talking about just increasing the floodplains so that they could have more arable land okay. to basically. And what struck me about that is because you see the damage that's done. This is very deliberate because a lot of people don't realize is that all of the civilization took place along the banks of the Nile. So all of the artifacts, nothing just kind of, apart from maybe like the, the Fayum Oasis, all of Egypt's civilization takes place along the banks of the Nile. That's where the artifacts are, that's where the temples are. Life was situated along the banks of the Nile. So when you create these floods, you burst these banks and you essentially flood everything. And to do that, just to increase the arable land or the floodplains, does it even make sense? Because essentially you're just, you're flooding and everything. To so say you're basically saying, we just want to grow. Why, why don't you just flatten everything and then turn everything that was already there into farms, if that's what you're trying to do. So even the logic behind the reason of why they were flooding these, you know, multi-thousand year old antiquities and relics and things that, any culture in the world should be respecting but even the reasoning behind it doesn't seem to add up so just to ask you here live right now to ask you a question that's really really straight what do you think or what in your view from the research you've done that's just been on the ground what do you believe the motive behind the flooding the multiple floodings that are taking place along these plains are okay there's two reasons and if you could um maybe find one of the damn photos sure. um, as well and folks by the way there's, there's more than one way to spell a damn photo because uh you know these is a lot of dams that are being built so uh it's there's two reasons I, i'm pretty clear i've been in the field now since 2007 systematically documenting the areas that have uh been flooded so that image there is one connected to that um oh. image but if um, should i get a different one should i try do you want that one not that one, one yet they, they need to know okay well you, you can look at that one okay so that one there you see it's the it's the Meroway dam this is at the fourth cataract in sudan now okay now okay if you, if you hold it right there now now this one you see that big lake this is a reservoir so this is after the Meroway dam at the fourth cataract in sudan this was completed in 2008 so this is now an area of a 108 mile long area and underneath that area is um not only a 108 mile long reservoir but guess what's underneath 2500 previously unknown undocumented ancient Kushite archae uh, um, uh, archaeological sites. Let me repeat that. Underneath this huge area that just created, that you're looking at, this 108-mile-long area the, of the Meroway Dam, there's 2,500 previously unknown 
unexcavated ancient Kushite archaeological sites, gone, obliterated. We'll never know anything more about it. And the reason why we know this 2,500 previously unknown, undocumented sites is right before the day of the Merrowway Dam was finished in 2008, there was a kind of a hit and run survey by the National Corporations of Antiquities and Museums in, in Sudan, or they call it INCAM. They went out to try to survey the areas, the area that was going to be flooded to just record in as much as they could that these were archaeological sites and to try to find out what historical period they were. But very few that they could even even attempt to do an excavation because it takes a long time. It takes it takes not just weeks, not just months. It takes years. So uh, it's just surface archaeology, just to say, okay, this is a site. Let's identify if it's um, so-called prehistoric. Is it from the Christian period? When is it from? And look, we can't excavate. Let's move on. But 2,500 previously unknown, unexcavated ancient Kushite sites underneath the water. And guess what? 50 to 70,000 people were displaced, and the Sudanese government did not give them any compensation, Not none of them. And the Manasir, that group, they went to protest because they didn't receive anything from the government at the time. So they were protesting that they did not receive compensation. But this is one of the greatest losses because at this location in Sudan, at the fourth uh, cataract, the place of Merway, this is ancient Kush, but it's underwater. People were displaced in protest to it. Now, that's the after effect. Now, if you go back to the one you showed just before this, Brother uh, King, yeah. um, and if you can toggle back a little, uh, and people can see the before and after. This is the after. Oh, and then if we go back to the other damn image, you'll see um, that, okay, that, that's after. So, um, that's before. This is after or before that same degree. One. Yeah. This is before. Yeah. Okay. This is before. There is no reservoir. There is no lake because the dam hadn't been completed. So you don't. So you see the Maryland Dam. I went there. We. I went behind the dam to record what I could, to document what I could in the short period that I had, and um, it was amazing experience to go and meet the people who said, "Hell no, we're not leaving our traditional homeland." They refused to leave, but eventually they had to because either leave or get flooded. So this is before, but then after the Merway Dam. And by the way, you're looking at the Nile. Okay, so if you're looking at the far right, folks, the Nile is flowing from right to left. Mm -hmm. That's the flow. So that means that when you see the Merway Dam, when the you see it labeled there, when the water flows and the dam is built, that means that right after... Uh, so is this image upside down then? No, no, no. It's it's, it's right because now it uh, it kind of zigzags, it zigzags and winds its way through Sudan and it takes a turn. So it, it's in the right uh, orientation. So it's flowing from from top to bottom. Right. And this yeah, image. top to bottom. So that means that when the water hits the the Merway Dam, it backs up. So that means that it backs up in the direction of the flow of the Nile. So that's the before picture. And then again, if you now go back to the after, and then when it, when, when it goes to the after, then again, to remind you, this is the results of the flooding of ancient Kush. Shocking. Well, when it gets back to the, to, the, uh, to the after photo, that one, you see that wasn't there before, but it was created after 2008. So what's underneath the water? The artifacts from ancient Kush. What's underneath the water? Villages that house 50 to 70,000 people. And so why would this be done? So back to that original question, what's the motive? Two motives. Number one, to obliterate evidence of ancient Kush and obliterate evidence of ancient Nubia. That's number one. And then number two, mm -hmm. the goal is financial. These dams are not to create hydroelectricity for the people. The dams were to make money for those in charge because they, they, they built the dam to do what? Export the energy to neighboring countries. So the goal mm -hmm. is obliteration and destruction of the physical evidence of ancient Kush, 
in ancient Nubia and also to make money at the same time. So it's a dual criminal project. It's a dual criminal project with outrageous goals that the local people didn't agree with. And uh, this is why people resisted. And when I was there, the Montesir tried to blow up the damn dam. And they ran out. Some of the archaeologists told them, you got two days to get the hell out of here. And so when I went, people say, hey, professor, um, you, you can't go because the people are, are too aggressive. So what did I do? I went anyway and talked to the Montesir and, uh, and, and, and got their input. And the Los Angeles Times newspaper had identified them as uh, Arab farmers. They're not Arab farmers at all, completely African. So I've mm -hmm. talked with these brothers for about an hour or so to find out what was happening and get the details. And they told me why they resisted. The government didn't want to pay them anything for their date trees. You know, they're, they're date farmers. They wouldn't get anything. And the government promised a little bit of what they should have earned and never gave them that. But this is one of the mm -hmm. greatest losses. But it's not just the Merrill Way Dam and the destructive uh, uh, results of it. It has harmed the ecosystem. It's destroyed the artifacts. It's destroyed the modern life of the people. And they were ran off to a desert environment. This is a great cover-up. But the, the bigger issue is it's not just there, but along the Nile, a whole series of dams that were scheduled to be built. They were stopped because of the fact that that um, uh, Omar Bashir, the dictator who had mm -hmm. ruled for 30 years from 1989 to 2019, he was overthrown. And Bashir was the one initiating these um, these dam projects uh, and um, and getting help from Chinese banks, Chinese construction, um, construction firms, Chinese workers. And there were other local workers from around the country coming to help with this project. This seemed like a huge city that they were constructing mm. when we went to the dam. But the bottom line is this. There's a whole series of these dams, and it mm. threatened to turn the Nile, the Living Nile River, into a series of isolated lakes. Unbelievable. That's the issue. So it's to destroy one of the great and, that, and, that, and this image here is the larger image you see on the nile yeah it's so going see how around it down. yeah and so yeah you see that so it's the merway yeah. dam reservoir 108 mile long but there's a number of other dams you see where it's uh at the peak of the nile the top part there uh, it's a couple more dams there that i had to go mm -hmm. through and look at because the whole area was threatened to be turned into a series of isolated lakes and why choose the heart of Kush? Why choose parts of Nubia? Because that's a part of the plan to destroy the evidence of African high-level civilization. And secondly, to make money while doing so. And, and, can, and I by just, the way, I can I just say this last thing? Please, uh, please. Uh, one, one last thing. In case somebody thinks that this was legitimate, Number one, where in the hell are the feasibility uh, um, projects and projections? How come they did not do as the World Commission on Dam said, get approval mm. from the local people who they claimed that they were going to benefit and have mm. them involved? They weren't involved. And But here's the other thing. They could have used other sources to generate electricity, such mm. as wind turbine. It gets very cold in the desert at night, so they could have used wind turbine. What about solar energy? It's a desert. Mm. Of course, there's a lot of uh, sun around. What about the technology that works very well in other parts of the world, which is micro hydro? So they could mm. they could use micro hydro, solar energy, wind turbine. Didn't use any. They use uh, the dams or hydroelectricity because it's more lucrative. Makes no sense. And yeah. what about world heritage? It's just it's amazing how world heritage just suddenly go completely silent when it comes to destruction of African, you know, just thinking on a very logical level, if artifacts of this degree existed anywhere, like somewhere in Europe, there would be no, there would be no discussion about a building of a dam to flood any kind of any kind of value. Now, I mean, for the fact that they'll keep Stonehenge, you know, and <laughs> certain artifacts, you know, and and they hold them in such high regard and you're talking about the flooding 
of statues, pyramids, obelisks, all these things have just literally been completely destroyed by these dams and no one cares and there's no outrage and there's no outcry and it shows that this is not some conspiracy theory. You know, we as people of African her heritage, we melanated people, we are very aware of what's going on, going on around the world and the fact that there is a unison of these various groups to either work together to destroy our heritage or to be silent when our heritage is being destroyed. All of a sudden, people will suddenly lose their humanity when it comes to something that's being inflicted upon Africans. And it's just, just I mean, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying the live stream, but I'm sitting here and I'm getting increasingly angered. <laughs> I can feel my blood boiling. No, literally, my blood is boiling because there's so... these what's happened you know starting with lake nasa actually it doesn't start with that because we only know about that because it's been documented i actually believe that this these lake projects have gone on across the continent i believe this happened in west africa i believe there are many um lakes in nigeria that i've spoken about on live streams before that are hiding antiquities beneath these hydroelectric dam projects so i don't think this is a one-off and i don't think this is a a new thing they've just started i think this is something that is tried and tested way of destroying antiquities and i think they've done it in america as well so i'm not going to go into all of that so the point i was going to make is <laughs> it's just really angering because when it comes to our antiquities there just seems to be no respect for it um, I want to give a quick shout out to Kinda Lynch. You gave a twenty dollar donation, and I have kind of it's gone past now, but I really, really appreciate that. And I'm, I'll put a, a comment on the screen from Nada, Nubanada, who's a Nubian, and she says there is still constant blackouts in Sudan and Nubia. This didn't help at all. So just really just supporting what you've just said there. Where's the feasibility? Where was the benefits assessment where has any of this has anyone even referred to what happened in lake nasa to see how successful that project was before they've gone and they've started building these multiple dam projects and obviously we know none of this is taking place because this isn't a legitimate project this is agenda driven but yeah sorry i'm gonna hand it back to you now <laughs> well yeah it's, it's it's an agenda it's a financial agenda and a racial Again, agenda against African people and African artifacts. A couple of good points that are being made in the chat. You're right. If anybody, that this wouldn't happen in Asia, but guess what? If somebody had even suggested building dams or a dam that would flood any part of ancient Greece, that person would be arrested on site. <laughs> yep. So that's number one. They, they would be arrested on site indefinitely. And um, the other question that's raised, I appreciate that question. What about underwater archaeology? Good question. Here's the problem. Mm. Those that have the interest in underwater archaeology don't have the resources. And those that have the resources don't have the interest. Because they mm. do the underwater archaeology in the north. They do it in the Mediterranean, you know, in the southern, uh, I'm sorry, in the northern tip of Egypt near Alexandria, they'll do underwater archaeological work there because they know that they're going to find artifacts from the foreigners at the very end, the Greeks and Romans. But those mm. same folks do not go to the south to do underwater archaeology because it's not in their interest to uncover anything that uh, indicates high-level African achievement. So, um, But underwater archaeological work could be done. It's just that it's not. And then uh, there, there might be a couple other images um but yeah let's tell me where to skip to because you've sent me so many images now um, well they're, 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 they're out of order so just flip through and <laughs> uh, okay if, 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 if you've got a bit of a delay when i'm showing them that's the only thing so you're not seeing them in real time um okay, um, okay i can describe sure? as i'm going through okay so i've got so, image of southern Ethiopia armor valley at the moment um okay if if you go to image okay well that's some of the work of the destinage that i've done uh this is part of a demi ceremony and they're wearing the uh the women on the left wearing the colobus monkey the men wearing the leopard outfit that are worn only by the most illustrious people in the society but if you can find some images of uh, ancient uh kushites like there's uh kushite princes princes or there's also uh, images of kushites 
as well. They um, jet black skin. You see their oh, yellow yes. okay, I've got them here. hair. Yeah. Should I pull out the Timo Floy? Is that the one you're looking for? Uh, yeah, there, there's yeah. some ones from from Hui's tomb. Yeah, we can always come back. These are some modern images from our field work, but um, that one's fine. Can you go to another one? Let's see. Um, from that same tomb. And there, there's images of, okay, that one. Okay, now if you take a look at this one, folks, take a look at this. these images. Um, the people who don't know, the Egyptologists and some of them call themselves Nubiologists. Um, this is a very important image. These are folks from the area of South Sudan. They're not from Nubia or anything like that. Now you see the skin color. This is what disturbed George Reisner when he saw black, I mean, literally black skin, super black skin, double skin number, double black, blue black, amazing black, wild black, stunning black. Literally, it disturbed him and it disturbs others to know that Africans were achieving at a very high level. These are not just, quote, nilotics. We all know that. We've known it from the Nile Valley, but when I showed these to chiefs and uh, elders, guess what? They give specific details of these images that they've never seen before. Mm. But, but, ah, they have seen them because this is their culture, because um, they know. So now you look at these men, notice that the one on the far right, notice he's wearing linen, and then as you pan from right to left, notice the aprons they're wearing. This is cow skin. Mm. The cultures are intimately connected and related to cows. This is how the culture works. Everything about their culture integrates in, in, uh, in the cow, for example. So, mm. so you see this cow skin, and, and, and they can identify regional, regionally what or what people these represent. So you notice the jet black skin color, that's not an exaggeration. Mm. Notice the hoop yep. earrings and notice the hair. These are not wigs. Notice the, the red hair on the far right mm. and then you see the guys with the yellow. Okay, why is it that color with jet black skin? Here's why. Because this is from cow urine, mm. cow urine. And when they um, put the cow urine on their hair for about six days or so, it changes that color. And this mm. is done among the where the Dinka, the Mandari. This is what they do now. And this is an image from thousands of years ago. So you notice the hair, uh, hoop earrings, notice the loins, and then notice that they are of high level very high level how do you know well it's not only nicely executed but take a look at the feathers on top of their head you mm -hmm. see the feathers and uh, mm -hmm. now if you follow what i was saying earlier folks these feathers represent what the ostrich and not anybody can just wear an ostrich feather it must be someone of extraordinarily high rank and worn in important ceremonies mm -hmm. and so the elders and the chiefs, they give details about this image or these Im this, this kind of image that they've never seen before. How can they give so much detail? Because they're very familiar with all the cultural paraphernalia and the hairstyle that you actually see. That's what Kushology is about. So while the dams have flooded large areas and, um, and people have distorted the record, the outsiders, the Westerners, but at the same time, we learn so much in the field by uh, by looking at these ancient images and showing that, wow, it ain't much change at all. People are still in their cultural dancing. You know, they love to dance. And when they dance, they have the ostrich feather. You know, mm. uh, even in wrestling, you know what's important in South Sudan is wrestling. Wrestling is like a national sport, but it hasn't become big time only because there's no money involved. People haven't invested in it but you have groups from one area or another, they love to watch and witness the, the wrestling. You know, it's part, of, it's part of what they do. And, you know, some of the wrestlers, like somebody might have a local fame, they wear the ostrich feather. Or when mm -hmm. they're in uh, Juba, 
the capital when they when they go to an area and they have the culture of dancing among the Dinka, you have some that will wear the ostrich feather, but it's important uh, ceremonies and rituals, important people. So anyway, that's what I wanted to show. So at least people get an idea of the Kushites mm. in there. Actually, there's one more that I'll, okay, well, this one here is very special. These princes, we know they're princes. They're from Kush because it says Kush. The text says Kush. Well, how do we know they're princes? Because not is, only the so sign is that the part is, is that is that where it says Kush? Is that Kush there over there, or is it somewhere else? No, it's a little bit to the right there. Um, yes, yeah, so okay. it's a little bit yeah to, to in front to the right. But uh, so it's Kush, and uh, there, and then notice the crowns on their head. So we know that they are of royal rank because the crowns on their head. But if you look at the man farthest to the right there, you notice a big side lock of hair. Mm -hmm. The reason why it's the side lock of hair, it indicates youth. It means he's a younger person. So whenever you see a side lock, it indicates youth. So this is why they're not kings, they're princes of the royal family. And by the way, that color scheme of jet black and brown, those are colors mm. you see today. And then you yeah. notice the, the beautiful jewelry, beautiful earrings, the broad collars, the linen, the beautiful linen uh, uh, um, linen outfits. And if you continue to pan on to the left, notice there's an assistant. You see his two black arms. He has a leopard skin draped on one arm. And notice he's holding rings, three and three. These so three means plural. It means that it's a lot. So they can't show tons of gold, mm. but they can show three. So three automatically means plural. And what this attendant is is uh, bringing behind them is gold. That's the image for gold. So a lot of gold in antiquity. A lot of gold right now. And above the rings of gold, that's the symbol uh, Nebu. And Nebu, it means gold. So there's the in black, that's the Medunetcher or mm -hmm. high gold for gold. And you actually see the rings of gold itself. And by the way, there was a gold rush in Sudan just before the overthrow of Bashir and before the uh, the recent civil war that broke out in Sudan in uh, April of 2023. Uh, but, but so it's a lot of gold and, and the gold now is being stolen. I mean, uh, Bashir was involved with siphoning off a lot of the money and big companies come in to mine for gold in Sudan. Now what's happening in Sudan, the Wagner Group from Russia and the United Arab Emirates. The Emirates are are extracting and stealing the gold and they have some pack with the ginger wheat causing havoc all over Sudan, displacing people, killing people, and putting all of the monuments at risk, just like the people mm -hmm. are at risk. But this is great images from ancient uh, Sudan. So I guess those are probably enough to give people an idea of what the work's about, about Kush. There's a lot that has been flooded, but we still have enough of the ancient artifacts and the modern current practices. I think I have one other, uh, one other image. Uh, if you could, I have, uh, I think I sent you. Um, okay, let me elder, ask you. Can, can uh, refresh? This Elder Abraham. I'm, I'm with uh, can I just give a quick a quick plug before you go on? I just want to give a quick plug to um, um, Professor Ampin's book. Okay, um, I put a link in the chat for it. You can find it on Amazon here. History of African civilizations. Okay, so it's here. History of African civilizations. Um, it, is there anywhere else you'd prefer them to purchase it from? Is, is there a direct website? Yeah, it's just a direct website. Advancing the research dot. Org. So if you um, advance in the research.org, yeah, advance in the research.org. If, if you go to the image, I have an image of the book with a QR code that I sent you as well. Okay, that'll be easier. Oh, yeah, there it is. Yep, yep, there. So people can just QR that. Let me actually see if I can get that up. I'll try that myself and I'll share the link. Okay. Yeah, so this is the book I teach. Uh, it's a requirement for the African-American studies majors and history majors at 
the college here in California is Contra Costa College. So um, the book is not only a textbook for college, high school and middle school, but it's also for the public as well. So it's to put a lot of this, uh, some of what we discussed in context with ancient Kush, ancient Nubia, and ancient Kemet. I'm just going to share that link. Just bear with me one moment. Yeah, you're right, RJ. It's twenty nine dollars. We want to just get the get the word out to make sure it's accessible to everybody. Mm. Okay, let me just pop that in the chat. There. Okay, so I've shared the link. Use that one rather than the Amazon one. I think um, would be better. Um, I think there's a few people who who want to buy it. Um, let me yeah, mute that. You, you know what I tell people: if they buy it from Amazon, they can, but I will never sign it. <laughs> <laughs> so you go. You won't. You won't. You won't get the love from from <laughs> Professor Am <laughs> if you buy it from Amazon. So if, I hope not too many people have hurried and got the Amazon link. Buy it direct, okay and it'll be sent with love yeah, exactly. <laughs> i think it's the, the message here um lovely okay um we've got we're about two hours 20 minutes in i feel like there's so much you wanted to cover the technical problems i think we'll have to get through those the next time we have you on but i want to get you on again very soon if that's okay professor very let's soon. Make it happen. Yeah. Let's make it happen, my brother King. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, because it's been enlightening and I knew it was going to be a good conversation. And I th yeah, there's there's just so much that we need to cover. I think I think there's so much people need to learn from you. Um, I Like I said, I'm going to be in contact with you very soon anyway, because of the work that I'm doing around. Um, I'm doing a bit of a documentary around the just specifically focused on the Nefertiti bus. I don't know if I mentioned that to you. Um, but I'm doing quite a bit of in-depth research about that at the moment. Um, and I'm going to need your feedback. Um, I might even want to interview as part of that, um, of part of that documentary. Um, I've been doing some research on the Fayum portraits as well, which are another bunch, bunch of hoaxes. I'm finding out recently. I was actually quite surprised because I was actually quite happy for those to be kind of just that Greco-Roman things that they found but it turns out it seems like they're just a bunch of entirely false um <laughs> fakeries that have just been kind of flooded into the public to to, to skew people's perspectives and that's been linked to um, f um facial reconstructions done of the actual mummies which has uncovered the fact that they're they're definitely black people <laughs> inside them even though they're from the Fayum, and even though those people would have been greco-roman seems they were black greco-romans even back then so there's Every time we do a bit more research, we just uncover more truth. And the more we dig, <laughs> the more we realize how far and how deep the rabbit hole of deception goes when it comes to our history. It's 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 quite disturbing. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, I wish for once I'd do a bit of research and things were just as they said they are. That would be nice. But it seems that's never the case. <laughs> it always seems like there's some kind of deception that's taken place and some kind of lie and destruction, obfuscation. And that's, I think, a part of what makes your work so valuable to me is that you've uncovered so much of this. And yeah, even like I said, even the very first, some of the art, some of my very first dives into the whole idea, like I heard about the Rahotep and Nofrit fakes from you from an article you posted many 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 years ago because i didn't know it was fake back then i just took for because even diop's got it in his book and diop says these are libyans you know he he just takes for granted that they're they're genuine right um which is fine because obviously he, he he probably you know no one's thinking they're gonna go that low um <laughs> <laughs> but then I think you posted one of the first articles and I mean this is probably going on nearly 20 years ago if, th if that rings a bell but I feel like you posted an article about this a long long time ago and that was one of the very first articles I read and that's when what opened my eyes to the fact that they do this kind of 
<laughs> stuff. So it's very work. Yeah, yeah, I thought yeah, so. Yeah, it was 30 years. Yeah, it, it was, it, the first article was published by the late, great Ivan Van Sertima. Mm. And it's actually in the book, Egypt, Child of Africa, that I first published on the Rahotep forgeries. Uh, I had been talking about it for several years, but it's uh, first published there. So it's very valuable because that's that's one of the so you're one of my founding um, <laughs> founding authorities when it comes to me actually to, um, actually stepping into this space. So, yeah, I want to thank you immensely. Um, like I said, it's been an absolute privilege to have you on the channel. You don't look like you've been um, in the field, you know, <laughs> doing tours for 30 years. <laughs> so <laughs> I think 35 they're, they're, years. Yeah, but 35. Wow, that's amazing. You don't, don't you don't, you don't look it at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, so. We, we got to keep it up. You know, this is not my occupation. It's my vocation in mm. life. So we, we got to keep the health up, my brother. No, 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 absolutely. Um, so it's it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the channel. Um, like I said, I'll get you on very, very soon. Please, everybody, can we just get some likes and some love flowing to um, um, Professor Ampim? Um, and yeah, if you if you've enjoyed this, please do by all means. You know, show your um, your love in the comments. Um, I always like going back to the live streams and reading the comments back because I don't get to read them when we're actually in discussion and or trying to find our images and doing presentations and stuff like that. So please do show your love and support. Um, let him know that you're going to be on the next live stream, which I think we'll schedule. I'm going to say roughly in and around three weeks. Does that window sound sound good to you? Yeah, let's let's do yeah. it. Amazing. Let's do it. And, and two brother, if I can just share, I know was, um, that people can um, they can email me at mainnewmpim at gmail, and um, obviously people can purchase the book to help support the work, and um, they can go to my website advancingtheresearch.org. And one other thing I'll share is that I'm I'm going to be taking groups to. Egypt or Kemet in June, and then also to Ethiopia in mm -hmm. June and July. So those would be two-week educational tours. So if anyone's interested, they can contact me. The tours are coming up. You know, they're coming up June 8th through the 22nd is the tour to to Egypt or Kemet, and uh, June 25th to July 10th is the educational tour to Ethiopia. Uh, yeah, to Ethiopia. So both can uh, join me if they have an interest to learn. I, I, might, I might be joining you. <laughs> yes, sir. So it's it's all available. Yeah, I'm I'm excited because then after the tours, then I'm going to continue my field work in Kushology. So uh, amazing. I'm looking forward to uh, this summer. So folks can join me. We still, but if they're interested, if folks are interested, they have to have to kind of move forward now because we got to get everything squared away as we get closer to 60 days out. So um, I appreciate it, my brother, being a guest on uh, the King's Monologue. I, you know, I love your audience. They're, they're serious and um, and we're serious. So it's a good match. Absolutely. Thank you. And I, 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 I'm, I mean, like like you said, the, the community here is amazing. Um, they make it very, very easy for me to do what I do. Um, and it's very motivating. Um, like you said, they, they're a serious community. They are about it. And actually most of my inspiration comes from the feedback that I get from them directly. So thank you everyone who's joined us. Thank you, Professor Ampin, once again for that excellent presentation. I feel like you could have talked about any subject <laughs> for a really long time. So um, next time we're gonna have the um, presentation software flowing, but thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I've had an amazing time with everyone and thank you Dr. Ampin. Please do buy his book um, The History of um, African Civilization. You can hear that you're going to be edified if you purchase that book. Um, get in contact He's I've uh, popped his email in the chat as well. You can access his website via the book link that I popped in the chat as well um, Yeah and I think on that note we love you, Professor. They're saying that's what kind of everyone's saying. So, <laughs> yeah, on that on that really positive note, thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic evening, and yeah, I'll see you soon, everyone. Bye bye. Cheers. Okay, thank you, Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>